we are live. So, welcome to 2021's Candyman Review and Thoughts film. Now, I am just going to scroll. So, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you are only interested in the review itself, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. It's, it's, it's length. Check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. Now, I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers for this movie. I will definitely be spoiling the 1992 movie, just there's, there's too much about this movie that you cannot say without spoiling that movie. And I definitely wouldn't recommend watching this without having already watched that. Although a lot of it is restated in this movie, it is still, it, it, this movie has a stronger impact on you if you recently watched the 1992 movie. I suppose, okay, I will, if, if I spoil one of the other two sequels, I, or, or this movie or any other movie, during the review itself, I will hold up an index finger while I, I'll verbally warn before I start spoiling, then I'll hold up an index finger during the spoiler so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. But once, you know, as soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers. And in, I, I will be discussing the ending. Now, content warning and or trigger warning, I am going to be discussing the potentially triggering content of this movie. Torture, xenophobia, lynching, body horror, race, class struggles, and police brutality. Now, let's see. Also, please don't. I have a tendency to sometimes, when I'm discussing a sensitive subject, use descriptive terms that I consider neutral that other people consider negative. So, if I say something that sounds judgmental, it may very well just be that I take for granted that people know I'm being descriptive and not judgmental. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. And I'm also. I'm not black, and I haven't had that kind of experience, I'm going to try my best to not, like, say something unbelievably stupid in relation to race. You know, I'm, I'm not asking for, like, blanket forgiveness if I do say something stupid, just, yeah, I'm gonna try, and, yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, so this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out, so feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie, in another tab. Now, anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. I'm not upset at how it compares to what I was expecting, the trailers and other marketing earlier movies in the franchise. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are fair criticism based on a budget when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. I'm not going to be saying very many negative things. I really, I really love this movie. In order to follow this movie's plot, you will have to have watched the 1992 Candyman, but thankfully not the sequels. This movie ignores them like they ignore the ending of the first movie. Now, let's see. Since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. Now, this is my very first viewing. I watched it earlier today. I, I did have lunch between 
watching it and now recording, but as little time, you know, I, I got to this recording this video as, as quickly as I could so that it would be fresh in my mind. There are a few sequences in this that, like, you know, if you, if you're epileptic, ep yeah, it's, yeah, those, those scenes are really not gonna be, yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure I would recommend anyone who has epilepsy watch this movie. Now, the movie is set in present day. A young painter, Anthony and his girlfriend Brianna, move into a gentrified loft in Cabrini Green and he he starts to investigate the story behind the Candyman. But the more he investigates, the more dangerous it gets. I've been hoping for a proper sequel to the original movie for, I don't know, 15 years by now. I don't think it's quite 20 years, but I'm certain it's over 10 years. It's hard to overstate how high my expectations for this were, and the fact that the movie managed to exceed my expectations. Yeah, this is, this is one of the best movies I've watched in a long time. Now, the, yeah, so this is a, yeah, the, the IMDb lists it as a horror thriller, which, yeah, it's absolutely 100% accurate, and it is terrifying, like, it's, it's been a long time since I've seen a movie that was this scary that I hadn't seen before, there are, there are you know, it doesn't top all of the classics, but it does reach the same level as several of them. Now, this was written and directed by Mia da Costa, and yeah, for, for those who don't know, she's a black woman, and Jordan Peele also helped write it, and he wrote and directed, this is probably not news to anyone, but Jordan Peele wrote and directed Get Out and Us, which are two excellent films. I love the satire and social commentary in them, and I think the allegorical aspects are a big part of that. This movie is more realistic and less of an allegory. It does still manage to fit in a lot of satire and social commentary. And... Let's see, so... Yeah, the the themes the, the we get further exploration of race. I am ecstatic that mainstream horror has reached a place where a story that is primarily about black people can now be told without the lead having to be a white woman. The leads and most of the major characters in this are black, and their experience as black people in America in the present day is explored. The 1992 film doesn't have very many black characters, most of the black people in the film are extras, you know, background, they're, they're there to sell that black people live in Cabrini Green, but, you know, like, okay, you have Anne-Marie, you have Bernadette, and I think it's fair to say that Candyman himself is enough, yeah, those, those are the three black characters in, in that one, and most of the other characters are white, and, you know, the, the sequels do have a lot more named characters that are non-white. Not all of them are black, some are Latinx, but in this one, it really is, yeah. Now, the, yeah, in a YouTube behind the scenes, clip, director Nita Costa said that, you know, people say Candyman, but they don't say Daniel Robitaille. He's not a monster. He is a painter who lost his life. I wanted to talk about humanity, and she said, I hope 
audiences get wrapped up in the story, they, they can engage with it, that they identify with the main characters, feel what they're feeling. I want them to be scared, I want them to be sad, and I want them to understand something more than they knew before walking into the theater. I, I think she absolutely nailed it. And let's see. Heavy Spoilers did a video called Candyman Explained Character Breakdown Origins Trailer Fan Theories and Everything You Need to Know. It's a really good video. I recommend watching it. And let's see. Like the 1992 movie, see the fact that the thing is both of them are just called Candyman, so I have to say the year that they came out. Anyway, you know, that's it's the same thing with Halloween 2018. There are other movies that. But the, you know, the 1992 movie did a really great job fitting in a lot of urban legends. This one also fits in several. And... Right, actually, yeah, the, the Heavy Spoilers video was the first one of their videos that I watched. Found it by doing a search on YouTube for Candyman. And, yeah, really great video. I subscribed to them because of it. And... I am going to very briefly talk about, you know, the, the the first three movies, just really, really briefly. The 1992 movie is a masterpiece. It's it's no this this one is much better, but still. The first sequel has some good to it, and the second sequel is garbage. There's almost no real redeeming features to the third one. Now I would say that the main reason that I went to watch this in theaters as quick as soon as I possibly could and that I'm doing this video is you know it's it started with my love of the original 1992 movie which once again I'm not sure 20 years ago I'm not 100% certain I had watched it that far back I'm certain that I watched it at least 10 years ago it's possible that I watched it 15 years ago, and just, it's it's one of those things where, like, I would only want a sequel if they could do a really good job of it, and I would say this movie definitely, yeah, this, this was well worth making for, yeah, and, let's see, um, Right, I would also recommend Wee Lin's video on Candyman. She makes some really great points in that. I'm going to try to focus what I say about this movie in, in this video, but I've, I've seen some people criticize that in the... F yeah, I'll, I'll make this real brief. I've seen some people criticize that in the first movie there are many differences between details in some of the Candyman killings that we're told about. There are details in there that are not seen in the kills we do see. You know, you have stuff like d d his name said into a mirror five times. Does it have to be the same person saying it five times? Or can one person say it four times and then another person say it once? And then there's the bit about like it's supposed to when you when you find someone killed by the Candyman, it's supposed to turn your hair shock white, and I think the idea is supposed to be that 
you know, by the end of the 1992 movie, we're certain that Candyman's killings were real, but the details vary and change over the retellings of the killings. It's like a game of telephone. Now, let's see, so the... Yeah, so the writing I already mentioned, Jordan Peele, Nia DaCosta, and also Wynn Rosenfeld. And yeah, I already mentioned Jordan Peele, Get Out, and Us. And let's see, the. Yeah, Bernard Rose is credited as writing because some of this movie is based on the stuff in the 1992 film, and Bernard Rose wrote and directed that movie and you know based on the short story by Clive Barker or it, sorry characters and the other stuff I've seen by Clive Barker that yeah based on something by Clive Barker are Dread the yeah yeah Candyman for the the other the old three Candyman movies Hellbound, Hellraiser 2, and Hellraiser, the original one, yeah. And, yeah, the writing is really good. Like, there is a real, you can really tell that it's it's written by black people. Their perspective on how to write black characters and processing black pain in a movie, you know, there's a, there's much more of a, you know, it, it's, it's very clearly based on lived experience. Now, let's see. Right, and another just real quick thing about one of the other movies. One of the problems with Candyman Day of the Dead, the third movie, is that it's not really got any interesting new ideas. It's a sequel made to cash in on the on the success of the first movie and possibly the second one. I'm not sure how successful that one was. And yeah, this movie had something interesting to to add to the Candyman idea that wasn't in the first three movies. I'm not sure I can really reveal it yeah I it it will be in the in the section called notes taken while watching the movie handles plot twists really well there are not too many none of them are bad there aren't too few they're not too easy to figure out for the viewer and this is not one of those movies that, you know, where once you learn the twist, the movie falls apart. It's not difficult to keep up with all the twists, even on an initial viewing. Now, I would pretty much be willing to watch Jordan Peele and Nita Costa write and direct almost anything. Like, the... the the skill level here, the the amount of it's it their their work is incredibly impressive. So the yeah, this is the first thing I I've seen that Nia da Costa has directed, but she is also directing the Marvels, the second Captain Marvel movie that isn't a team up of you know. Brie Larson's Captain Marvel has appeared in multiple MCU movies, but, you know, this is, yeah, this one will, yeah, I hesitate to call it a solo movie because she's sharing the title with Ms. Marvel, and I'm going to go with Photon, you know, Monica Rambeau, who also appears in this, uh, you know, L L L Lashana Lynn, wait, uh, is that she she plays Brianna in this and yeah you know Nia Costa is known for Little Woods which she both wrote and directed I think I might have to 
find a, a copy of that and watch it. It's it's hard to to put into words how how well how strong of an impression this movie made on me. The movie understands horror movie tropes, both both in the writing and directing. There are some things that the movie plays straight. There are some things where it brings them up and it has a character react the way that a real person, someone not a character in a horror movie would. They, they simply refuse to do the stupid thing that the audience is like yelling at the screen not to do. And I, I thought they did a really good job. This is also something we see in Get Out and Us. And Jordan Peele is really good at writing these to where you don't know exactly when it's going to play, when, when it's just going to do a trope. Like, it, it never feels like his movies are just like, you know, okay, we'll do that because the trope calls for it. But sometimes there is a reason for something being a trope. Sometimes it actually is a good idea to have it in your movie. And, and a lot of the time, it's like, okay, we've seen it a million times before. Let's just be done with it. And he has a really strong sense of when to, to play something straight and when to, to subvert something or... Yeah. Now, let's see. The... I'm going to very briefly add. Yeah, the the opening, the very first thing in the in the movie. Actually, I suppose. No, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go into it later. What I will say is the the movie opens in a way that does a really good job of setting the tone and like letting us know some of what we're going to be seeing without giving too much away you know a lot of horror movies there's just you you get too much information right up front because they're terrified that the audience doesn't have the what's the word patience and attention span to to let the movie work and Again, Jordan Peele is really good at this. You know, Get Out and Us also have very strong openings. I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but it fits with what came before. I am extremely happy with the movie's ending. It doesn't have Deus Ex Machina. There's no convenient writing. Horror movie endings are extremely difficult to get right, and I they they just they did an incredible job here, really. Yeah, com coming up with something where the ending is satisfying in in a way that just a lot of horror movies don't have that have have strong endings and that's it's it's difficult horror movie endings are really really difficult and i don't begrudge anyone you know but at the end of the day it is the very last impression a movie leaves on you there are, there are movies that have great end you know some bad movies are saved by a great ending and some incredible movies are ruined by a bad ending and yeah, it's just it's it's so satisfying when you see a movie that is great from start to finish and where the ending really works and doesn't let you down. Now, this movie does not have a post-credit scene or anything else that means that you should like for sure sit through the end credits, although you know, if if you're in a situation where it's not really going to bother the people working at the theater, you know, they have to clean up and, and everything. 
if it seems like they won't mind the end credits you know it's not it's not just names you actually see these paper cutouts that you also see in at least one of the trailers and elsewhere in the movie you have these really really powerful paper cut like I, I don't know exactly who came up with that idea but just like please keep putting ideas like that into horror movies you are exactly what we need you are the you know you are injecting life into a genre that can sometimes get very stale and it's like since the first time I watched the trailer that has the paper cutouts, I haven't forgotten it. Like, the, the, yeah. So, yeah, it is worth watching the end credits for, for the paper cutouts if it is, if you're in a situation where it's not going to bother the people, then, yeah. The movie never loses your interest along the way. I wouldn't really say it's one of those movies where some parts are more enjoyable than others. It didn't really, it, it didn't have any lows for me. It was all highs from start to finish. Now. So the... The, um, right. So this is a a sequel to the nineteen ninety two movie, and that's difficult. It's difficult to you know right right off the bat. Like once again, I am spoiling the nineteen ninety two movie without warning. That movie's protagonist died at the end of that movie, and it it is, and thirty years that's a long time to, you know, that's a lot of time to pass between two movies. And once again, this is ignoring both of the sequels. Not to mention that, like, let's see, I think the second sequel came out in like nineteen ninety nine, so. That's still that's still twenty two years. Although technically this movie was done like last year, I think, and it only got released this year because of COVID. But it the, this movie does an incredible job at being a sequel to the nineteen ninety two movie. Like there were so many things where I could tell this was made by people who love that movie and. They, yeah, like there's, once again, you can watch this movie without having watched that one, but it just won't be quite the same. And the, the, what's the word? It's, yeah, this was made by people who loved the original, probably hated the, the two sequels. And who had something to add. It's it's not it's not a movie that was made just because they really liked the original. You know, I've seen sequels and th yeah, where where it's like, well, they liked the original, so they wanted to make another one, even though they didn't really have anything to add, or they and sometimes uh, sequels are made by people who didn't understand the original. Which is very much the like the 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 third Candyman movie clearly does not understand the the first one, and the second one also misunderstands some of the things that made the first one great. Now, let's see the. There are a few characters in this that 
are not the most likable characters ever. And I think... I don't think the movie pushes it so hard that, like, there are a lot of horror movies where there are characters that you really can't stand, and they're basically there so that the audience will cheer when that character gets killed, which I've never really thought was particularly... But I'm not going to get into that here. The... the Yeah, the, the movie doesn't... The the characters that are really, like, decidedly unlikable, they are not in the movie that much, and or you are not supposed to like them. I wouldn't really say that this is a movie where you're supposed to, like, cheer the, the killer. I don't think it's wrong to watch hor make or watch horror movies where a lot of characters die, but I... I don't love when the idea is that we're supposed to be glad that a certain character died. Now, let's see. So, the characters. Yahya Abdul-Mateen II plays Anthony McCoy. And he is a visual artist. And he... Yeah, just briefly, other than us, the only thing I've seen Yaya in is Aquaman, the solo movie. And yeah, he's he's great. All three of these, he's he's really great. I'm really glad that he's he's in such big movies. So Basically, Anthony is very similar to the character of Helen in the 1992 movie in that the char both characters are studying the Candyman. And, you know, the, the... I suppose... I'm not sure. Yeah, and it, with both of them, it's because they really want to do... They want to put out something really impressive. You know, she's, ah, what's the word? She's like, it's like her thesis as a, as a grad student. And when the movie starts, he has been unable to create anything for two years. So, you know, now he gets inspired by the Candyman. So he feels really passionately about, you know, diving deep into that. And 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 similar to Helen, he doesn't really appreciate the pain and trauma felt by the people who used to live in Cabrini Green. He's middle class, you know. He lives in Cabrini Green, but it's been gentrified since the events of the nineteen ninety two movie in in real life. And yeah, the the. You know, it, it, both, both movies are about that, you know, you, you don't, don't be, what's it called again, a mis misery tourist, I think, you know, if, if you see some, someone in pain, don't gawk and take pictures and, you know, write interesting stories and, and stuff like this, you know, actually relate to them. And I thought it was very interesting to do this sort of sort of story where someone is the, the, this this thing of having having this character who doesn't really who who doesn't let's see it's, it's not that he doesn't empathize he doesn't really he doesn't fully understand he you know he it's not something that he really thinks about that you know this yeah this pain felt by poor black people to to have a character like that be a black person but a um you know middle class black person i i thought that was very subversive and cold crash pictures also made a great video on the original movie and points out that 
1992 film is about white liberal fears about black people. And, you know, once again, I'm really glad that this movie is from the perspective of black people. The, it, it makes a world of difference. And, yeah, Teona Paris plays Brianna Cartwright, Anthony's girlfriend, and an art gallery director. And, yeah, the only other thing I've seen her in is WandaVision. She's great there, she's great here. And she is going to be in The Marvels with director Anita Costa directing that as well. And Nathan Stewart Jarrett plays Troy Cartwright, Brianna's brother. He He's gay, and I really thought they did a good job of having a character who was clearly gay and like... Like, there's no one, there's no one that's in denial that, no, Troy is gay. You know, every, everyone, like, he's not ashamed of it. He's not, like, there's, there's no sense of just, there, you know, in, in a lot of horror movies, you know, if you're, if you're divergent in some way, something bad is going to happen to you. And I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm not going to give away what happens to him, if anything. But I just really like that this is a horror movie that doesn't say it's, you know, there's something wrong with gay people. You know, he's... The, the, the you know, the character can sometimes be a little annoying. But there's no sense that he's, like, a bad person, which... I guess I kind of hope that someone watching this video will be like, why does that even have to be said? Sadly, there are people who think that if you're gay, there's something wrong with you. But, yeah, he's, he's supportive of her, and... Yeah, he's, he's a good person. And Coleman Domingo plays William Burke, a Cabrini Green resident who tells Anthony about the Candyman legend. He gives a really strong performance. Like, he... Yeah. Really, really excellent performance. And Tony Todd plays Daniel Robitaille slash Candyman. A vengeful spirit that kills anyone who summons him by saying his name five times while facing a mirror. I'm a huge fan of Tony Todd's work, be it horror or Star Trek, especially Voyager and Deep Space Nine. I prefer those to Next Generation. And I don't know. Hmm. No, I am just not going to into that. Okay, so Cassie Kramer plays Helen Lyle, Hale, blah, Helen Lyle, a, mm, is that, I suppose, yeah, so the, you know, the character portrayed by Virginia Madsen in the first film. I'm not going to lie, before I looked it up, I did not think that they would actually, that, hmm, nah, I guess, nah, okay, technically that's a spoiler, but, let's see. Now, the... In the, you know, in, in the Candyman movies, there are strong female characters who don't back down or scare off easily, really going against the trend in horror movies, and that is, is still the case here. There are strong female characters in, in this. Now, producer Ian, Co Ian? Ah, Cooper has a long relationship to the contemporary art world, so he knew that he had to make sure 
everything was exactly right, given that the movie is set in Chicago's contemporary art world. And I don't know, you know, I don't know a, a lot about the contemporary art world, but it looks like he did a really great job. And the director said on Juneteenth in a YouTube video that when someone is murdered, either they become saints or they are vilified. And the movie is in part reflecting on the Black Lives Matter movement. And... But yeah, the, the acting is all great. And some of the actors do an incredible job, even though they have, like, they have some limitations. You know, the, the, for example, the, the, when you see Candyman, he doesn't, I guess I'll, t I'll, I'll just say that there are some limitations. There are some things that he doesn't do. And he manages to communicate a ton despite these limitations. Now, the dialogue is quite good. The, you know, some of the characters talk the way people do in real life. There's no white noise in the dialogue. It conveys characterization and exposition well. And there's some really great characterization. You know, some of the characters, we see what they're like when things are going well, how they respond to things going wrong. And, you know, there's characters who are, you know, you see a, I suppose, yeah, never mind, that is kind of a spoiler. I would say that the movie's ponderings on race really stay with you long after watching the movie. The cinematography is excellent. Now, it's handled by John Gulasarian. I haven't seen anything else that he's DP'd. But there's like there's the scene you know, there's the scene there's there's scenes in an art gallery and one of the scenes is after everyone has left. And they've basically like they've turned out a lot of the lights, but they've left on just like a few lights. I think they're from some of the installations. And through that light, we just it's it's gorgeous and the and the shadows and just it's it's incredible. He's he's tremendously talented. And and there there are scenes where something yeah, just like the angle on on something like there's there's this bit where one character is in a like it'll sometimes have really subjective camera angles where you can you the viewer can only we the viewers can only see what the character in the scene can actually see and because of that yeah and the editing is great. The editing is handled by Katrin Hed Hedstrom. And again, I'm not familiar with her other work. But she she does an incredible job here. The the there are some incredible like smash cuts in in the movie like they some of the smash cuts in this movie really put the smash in smash cut and again it it does this thing with like playing the genre where like a horror scene that we've seen a million permutations of 
Okay, maybe not a million. 999,000. Okay. Many, many permutations of will start. And, like, I, I wouldn't say that I was ever like, okay, here we go, get it over with. But we're, we're basically, we're sitting there, like, anticipating the scene to play out. And instead, it'll cut. And we'll be told what happened. And, it, yeah, the, the movie does a really good job of this. The, there's no... The movie never feels... There's there's nothing that should have been trimmed out. Now, the special effects are really great. They do some incredible makeup and prosthetics work on this, like... Okay, this is kind of a spoiler, but I'll, I'll keep it vague. Anthony gets stung by a bee on, on his right hand, and gradually the, the sting gets worse and worse, and they do an incredible job of the makeup on that. No more spoilers. There's some CG and stuff where, like, you know, okay, that had to have... There must have been, like, a dude wearing a green suit, you know, something they could key out afterwards, but it's completely convincing. It never takes over the movie. You know, some horror movies get completely taken over by just this desire to show off effects. There's some incredible stunt work. Some of the people that are killed, like, basically, like, Candyman grabs their feet. You know, so, so like, if this is their head, if this is their head, they are like standing, and then he grabs their feet and smacks. You know, as as he pulls, their head smacks face first onto the the hard floor, and like you know, they'll leave a blood stain on the floor. And really, really, yeah, the 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 scenes of violence in this are really, really well done. Like the. Yeah, the, the kills and the other gore and such, incredibly well done. There's some incredible production design, like the... I suppose... I won't give away... Yeah, I can't... Uh, okay, so, so this is somewhat of a of a spoiler you see some of the lower class areas including Cabrini Green the way it used to look and they do an incredible job like you can practice you feel like you could reach out and touch it you can practically smell it no more spoilers time being great work on costumes as well there, there are some scenes Set in 1977, and they do an incredible job. Like, everyone looks like they belong back then, even though it was filmed in 2019. And, you know, the, the middle... You, you, you can immediately tell, you know, you, you see some of these characters. Are they, are they middle class? Are they, you know, poor? Now, I think this movie does a great job of, like, you know, it, it explores taboo, but without being judgmental or exploitative. And, yeah, well, you know, once again, the, the, you know, torture, xenophobia, body horror... And, and lynching. And... Let's 
So the yeah, the music was handled by Robert Ike Aubrey Lowe. And I have not seen anything else scored by the the movie has amazing music. That's again, you know, Jordan Peele did an incredible job on the or I mean the yeah, the person that he hired for Get Out and Us did incredible work on the score there as well. Now there's utterly incredible sound design. Like there are some of the like some scenes of violence, instead of showing very much, we hear what's happening and they do an incredible job on the sound design sound design. And that's also something it wouldn't feel like a proper sequel to the 1992 movie if not. Because that's, again, like, if you haven't watched in a while, go back and really pay close attention to some of the, some of the scenes of violence. It's, it's out of this world how, how great of a, a job they do with, uh, yeah. Now, the... So yeah, comedy, there's some there's some black comedy and yeah, they do a good job. The the movie is really good at it never becomes an actual comedy. It doesn't and and it's not afraid of letting something be scary, be powerful. It it just knows that every so often you know, it can be useful for a horror movie to ease off tension not by having something scary happen that we were anticipating but by having something funny happen and yeah excellent excellent job on that now the pacing is quite good the the movie never felt like it was rushing through something or taking forever for something there were things that in the trailer looked like that scene would be much longer but in in the actual movie yeah it played out very differently So the let's see I'm trying to think of this is where I would usually talk about what is the worst aspect of the movie. I'm not sure I can really think of much of anything negative at all. The, the aspect of the movie that I was most looking forward to was the exploration of race in America, and the movie does an excellent job. The, the movie exceeded my expectations there. Now, the movie is entertaining to watch. It is definitely also depressing and saddening, and, like, if you... If you're not already in a really great mood, if you if you're already kind of sad, maybe hold off on watching this one because it is not gonna make you're not gonna be happier after watching it. Now, the trailers give away at least a little too much. I've heard that all horror trailers today do. I don't watch that many horror movies, so I can't really judge, but I found, let's see, I found a 2 minute 32 second, 2 minute 27 second, 2 minute 43 second. I think at least one of those, I think I th two of those are the same one, just with a little, a few extra seconds, but anyway, yeah, they, they give away too much. I, I, as difficult, it's, you know, it's difficult to know if you like the movie if you don't watch any trailers. 
but there's definitely stuff in there like some of the trailers show things that happen very late in the movie. But if you do watch the trailers, you do get a pretty good sense of whether or not you like the movie. You know, if, if you like the trailers, you're more likely to like the movie and vice versa. Now, the cover and or poster do not give away too much, and they do give a decent sense of, you know, if you like the cover and or poster, you'll like the movie. If not, you will not. Now, um, so, the yeah, the movie definitely has some stuff to analyze and food for thought. You don't need to watch it more than once to under like to pick up everything, but it is. Uh, I'm definitely going to be watching it again, and I look forward to it. Now the the tomato meter is currently eighty nine percent with a hundred re reviews which is certified fresh and yeah seven what does that say the average rating by critics is 7.50 out of 10 89 fresh 11 rotten reviews and not enough audience ratings for an audience score yet now on Metacritic, it has 72 out of 100, based on 34 critic reviews, and there are not any meta Metacritic user reviews. Now, the on IMDb, let's see the. I'm going to try to do this as quickly as I can. 6.2 out of 10 is the current IMDb score. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand why you would rate it anywhere near that low, but whatever. I have extremely few negative things to say about the 1992 movie and the fact that there are actually very few scenes of on-screen violence is not one of them, but when we see Candyman kill, the gore isn't that graphic, which the kind of gore effects they had back then, they could have done. I don't know if it was the stylistic choice. When the doctor of the mental institution is stabbed from behind, we don't see the hook for a hand coming out the front of his chest, which is something that I think would have worked well. Same basic thing for Trevor at the end. Great sound work, don't get me wrong, great acting by the pretend by the actors pretending to die. Good amount of blood, but no gore during the, the deaths. You know, I, some good gore after, like Trevor, the gore on him after, when his body is found by Stacy is good. And yeah, so Brief spoiler for the second movie, but major spoiler. In the second movie, when Paul is killed, the, the gore there, that's the kind of thing I'm, I mean. No more spoilers for this one. And this movie, you know, again, I haven't watched that many current horror movies, but I've, I've seen several other current horror movies that have really excellent gore and, yeah, you know, this one, Halloween 2018, Us, and some some in Get Out as well. Although that movie really isn't focused on that kind of thing. And I, I would not say that there is too much violence in this. It's, it does serve a purpose 
now. This is capital C cinema, not junk food. And I recommend this to anyone who likes horror movies about urban legends, and especially to people who have progressive politics. The movie is definitely going to bother conservatives. And I would rate this 9 urban legends come to life out of 10. And that brings us to the thoughts section. So from here on out, spoilers. And if you don't care about these disclaimers, thought section start disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I'll try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of it is very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as sometimes through during this section once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. So yeah, from here on out, I will no longer be warning about spoilers for this movie, for the f first three movies, or for Clive Barker's short story, The Forbidden, which the 1992 movie is an adaptation of. I'm really glad that this is a sequel, a st in some ways a reboot. You know, now that we're talking spoilers, yeah, and and I think that I think it's the kind of thing where hypothetically you could make good sequels to this. I hope that they don't make a sequel without having really good ideas for it. But Jordan Peele doesn't really strike me as kind of person to make a sequel or to yeah to, to make something just because it's it's you know because it's attached to something that's successful now I don't have a problem with violence in the court in general. I think this is one of my favorite horror movies, movies in general. Also, of Cronenberg's The Fly, Video Drum, etc. And I probably will swear in this video, but no, don't worry, I will not be saying the N word. I'm probably not going to quote. Actually, do they have more than the one? It's said at least once in this war movie, but it's said by a black person. If I recall, it was said to another black person, and it wasn't said as an insult. It was, you know, an, an inside thing. Like, they know that they can say that word to each other. Now, the rest of this video is not a review, it's a series of well thoughts, some of it's analysis, some of it's MST3K riff tracks and other jokes. I'm not sure there's going to be that many jokes in this one. It's mostly going to be analysis. And the time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The section right after this one is thought to have while watching in chronological order. You could think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting of like. The section after that is thoughts that I had before watching. And once again, I don't have any personal experience with being black in America, so I'm going to try to not, you know, white splain or talk over, you know. I'm, I'm expressing my personal opinion and perception of, you know, yeah, the, the stuff in the movie. I'm not saying that I'm more right than black people. I'm, you know. Now, this is the part where I sometimes go into, does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? The movie definitely does not have empathy for white cops in black neighborhoods. But it does have empathy for 
Candyman, Can Candy Men, I guess is, and yeah, I I think that was the right choice. I th I think if you if you're willing to stand by while other cops do you know do terrible things to black people then you you're part of the problem and if you do refuse to stand by then you're probably no longer a cop or you no longer work in black neighborhoods now but yeah for for sure the movie has more the you know if the, if the movie says that any entity or group are evil then that is definitely not Candyman, but it is white cops. Uh, that I, I would definitely say that's that that's my interpretation. It's possible that I've missed something, but now as a horror movie, a lot there's a lot of negative depictions of women in horror movies, where they're treated as. Well, yeah, treated as disposable. I can't really claim that the the group of you know the the group of white teenage girls. You know the yeah the movie doesn't really that they're kind of treated as disposable. I'm not sure I would really say that the women are depicted as being any worse than the men like there's there's some people who behave badly on both now let's see yeah the 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 thing about how the intern like the guy who has sex with all of his interns and usually they don't use protection so he gets them pregnant and they have to you know he he pays for a the, the I, I forget what it's called but the 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 pill for yeah if you've become pregnant and you want to have what's it called a chemical abortion but yeah But I really appreciate, you know, you have this and us. Like, I mean, yeah, Get Out has a strong woman, but not, you know, for, for a while we think it's a good thing. Yeah, once again, keep in mind, I am I'm not warning for spoilers for Get Out and Us. You know, Get Out, like for a while you maybe think, oh, it's, it's a good thing that... Andre, I think his ah Chris. Yeah, it's a good thing that Chris has. I forget her name, but yeah, you know. But then you realize she's in on it. So, but yeah, and in you know, in us and in this, like you have a a major female character, and in us, she's the protagonist. In this, she's not quite the protagonist. Although, I mean, they sort of do switch to her being the protagonist near the end of the movie. After Anthony... I mean, yeah, there at the end, Anthony would be an unreliable narrator. But yeah, in, in both Us and This, near the end, a female character is like, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. Because that's stupid. That's... That's... You know, I want to survive this situation. If I take that course of action, I will not survive. So I'm just not doing it. So I really appreciate that. I, I will briefly say, I'm not saying that you can't have edgy jokes. And I, I do think that it was kind of funny, the thing about how, you know, the guy had to... You know, he, he's so, he has so much casual sex with his interns 
that he has to I forget exactly how they worded it but there was something about that like he had to you know he, he had to pay for a lot of these you know chemical abortions and I'm not saying you can't do edgy jokes I just don't think that I think it would have I think maybe it would have worked better if there was more of a point like if it needed to be in the movie get out has m a number of jokes about cultural stuff cultural differences between white people and black people and it's hilarious and it like if you removed it you would take away a chunk of what the movie's about you know like we've had so many movies made by white people don't understand black people and reduce them to stereotypes and then along comes you know like Peel worked for for a number of years as a comedian and a lot of his material is racial and or race based I guess because racial makes it sound like it's almost racist but yeah you know he he does he yeah he does race he does com comedy exploring race and yeah you know he makes this horror movie where the black guy you know the the yeah he he has a lot of fun with all of these stereotypes and i think that if it had been stuff like that for this movie that that i think would have and I'm not really I'm I'm not police I'm not trying to police anybody's comedy. I am just saying you know, it is something you have to be extremely I think it's important to be to be very conscientious about what you put into movies like this. But again, it's possible that there is a really great explanation for it and just yeah. And you know, don't get me wrong, I, Jordan Peele knows more about horror movies than I do. That, that is 100% clear. I'm just, I'm just expressing my opinion. I'm not saying my opinion is more right or more important just because I'm white. Now, the movie is in a genre where it is very important not to overexpose the threat. And, yeah, the movie does an incredible job. Like, I was a little concerned that maybe the movie would have just like scene after scene where we very clearly see Candyman going up and killing someone. And yeah, I I mean really for almost the entire movie we barely see someone like struggling against Candyman, which is something that like I'm not saying it's a bad thing about the 1992 movie, but the, the, you know, you see the, let's see, I'm having trouble remembering if we see, I did, yeah, I think we see, yeah, both the Doctor of the Mental Institution and Trevor, we see them struggling, we see, we see the pain on their face as they're being cut with the, with the hook for a hand, but in this, like, I mean, they're at the very end when Anthony has become Candyman. Then we do have some. But other than that, we mostly don't really see... Yeah, I, I think they did an incredible job. It's tremendously suspenseful. Now. That brings us... To the next section. Entitled Notes Taken While Watching. For the last couple of movies, I let's see. I, I used to go through at least two pads, or 
no, yeah, I used to be able to, you know, two pants of paper and get, yeah, I, yeah, you can get a little bit of a sense of how, how many, how much paper is in this. I th if I recall, the last, I said two, the last two movies, I think, I only needed one pad. But for this one, I needed both, although the second one isn't, like, extremely full the way that it used to. Anyway. So the... Right. Before I... I, I wrote this while the previews were playing. You know, based on the trailer, I thought that the the white teen girls saying Candyman into a mirror five times, I thought that would be an early scene, but it actually happens fairly close to the end. But, you know, the, the I think it was that someone had theorized that the black girl in the bathroom would take the fall for it. But I don't think that was said that it happened you know the the art critic her like her husband was a suspect when the what's the word when when her body was discovered by him anyway the but but yeah you know, I want to note that countless innocent black people have been treated as guilty. All of the Candyman films, all four of them, have white women and or teen girls saying Candyman five times into a mirror. I mean, I realize that some of them do have plot armor, but do they know that? And I, I quite like, you know, the... In at least one of the trailers, you know, like a black woman is told the the Candyman story. You know, if you say if you say his name five times into a mirror, he comes and kills you. And she's like, "Who would do that?" And in the trailer, it smash cuts directly to the you know the white teenage girls. And yeah, that that is see that is legitimately funny. You know, because the look, I've never been a teenage girl. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna judge. I'm sure it is extremely difficult. I don't doubt that for a second. But, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna say, regardless of who you are, please don't eat Tide Pods. Please don't do like stupid things that you've heard about online. It just, yeah. Now, I, right, I want, I noted, is it technically a slasher movie? Yeah. And, let's see, are all the kills in the trailers? Most of them, yes. Most of the kills do appear in the, in the trailers, which is too bad. Like, it really, it's too bad that so much... Like, a lot of really good stuff. Like, the movie wasn't spoiled for me. But I could imagine that if you're... I'm, I mean, they really give... They give away a ton of stuff. Really, the only stuff that they didn't show at all were the, the white cops at the end getting killed. But we see the suicide by Brianna and Troy's mother. Let's see, we, we see the art critic, we see the gallery person and his young female intern. Hmm. Yeah, and the, and the white teen girl. Yeah, yeah, I think, I, th I think they did a good job of not having, I don't feel like there's any, like, once again, I, I don't love that they kill off a bunch of teenage girls in, in such a short amount of time. Although, I mean, 
actually come to think of it, I guess maybe it's supposed to again like say like om almost like here you go, here's you know, you want us to kill off a bunch of teenage girls, don't know why, but here you go. Because it's a slasher movie. Yeah, that that might be be why. But I do appreciate that a lot of the characters killed off are actual characters. Like, we know who they are. We know what defines them. I really, I'm, I appreciate that Troy, I'm sorry, I forget his boyfriend's name, but Troy and, and the boyfriend, I really appreciate that they didn't die. Like, the movie's not like, ooh, being gay is sinful, so you have to die if you're gay. You know, there, there are characters who die because they're stupid, and there's, you know, there's characters who die because of being hateful and such, but Troy, hashtag Troy did nothing wrong. You know, he he tries to protect his girlfriend, you know, he's he's protective of her, even when Anthony is behaving like a normal human being. Right, that was another thing I wanted to, to say. I really appreciated that Brianna, like, the moment that Anthony starts behaving in a scary way, she she leaves and she's like, don't follow me. I really appreciated that there wasn't this, like, that, and, and that's, like, because it's it sends a message. Like, if you, if you as a woman experience something like that, it's, it's the right thing to do to leave. You know, ultimately, in the movie, Anthony isn't interested in hurting her, although he does, you know, come to think of it, I guess he doesn't start hurting people before he becomes Candyman, and it was the racist cops that made him into Candyman. But yeah, you know, the, the, ah, what's the word? There was a... You know, the, the, it's the kind of thing where you really shouldn't take a chance. You know, if you are a woman and your boyfriend starts destroying things and yelling at you to do a certain thing or not to do a certain thing, that's a red flag and you should react to it. You shouldn't just say, well, oh, maybe soon enough he'll be, you know, he just needs some space or... Maybe I just need to listen more or something. No, it's not your fault. Leave. So I, I really appreciate that. I, that's, yeah. I guess actually maybe that's part of it that the, the white teenage girls, that's like, you know, they're supposed to teach you what not to do. No, I think that, yeah. That brings us to the actual notes on the notepad that I took during the, yeah, while watching the movie. I quite like that they use the Candyman song in the opening and the, the Universal logo and other logos are shown backwards. And the song warps and you hear this loud noise of buzzing bees. Very effective. And we see Cabrini Green in 1977. I I thought the movie did a really good job showing right away that like these cops really don't understand you know these black people, black children. Like you know, the the kid walks past, Burke walks past, he's you know, he's gotta do the, the laundry. And, and the police are like, hey, have you seen this guy? And they, and, and he, you know, he doesn't respond at all. He just turns and walks away. Because if he says, no, I haven't seen him, then it doesn't matter if that's a lie or not. That's going to be seen as, like, talking to the cop, you know, working with the cops. Which, and, and that's actually, that's a neat thing, you know, in, in the first movie... You know, the, the child does say, 
that he doesn't talk to cops. He's never going to talk to a cop. And then in this one, you see that same, you know, so that, that was, I don't know for sure if it was an intentional wink or not. I, I could imagine it might be. But, you know, the cops were like, what gives? You know, not at all understanding that if he talks to cops, you know, that's going to really, that's going to lead to a lot of, of pain. And I thought the, you know, it's a, it's an old, yeah, what, what are they, golden, it's a golden oldie. You know, he approaches the laundry room and like, I don't know if it's like a short, actually, I guess it's because the last person who used it left and it, and, and, you know, maybe 10 seconds ago or something and it's still on, but you know, before he gets in, the light cuts out, and then he goes in, presses the button, and it, like, flickers on, which is also, like, you know, sometimes you watch a horror movie, and it's like, why is that light flickering? Like, okay, for an atmosphere, sure, but it doesn't make any sense. This is a new light. It should not be flickering. There's nothing supernatural. It's, it's fine if it's supernatural, you know, but here it is communicating Cabrini Green was not you know, the, the upkeep was not kept up, is that, the upkeep wasn't there. And, you know, you see, you see the big hole in the wall, and first the, you know, Burke just passes it, and then when he goes back out, you know, a piece of candy lands, and, and, and then you see Candyman actually stepping through the hole in the wall. And then it cuts. We don't get to see exactly what happens next, but yeah, and you know the cops hear Burke yell, and the cops wait. Yeah, that's... and we get the opening credits, and we see the sky and buildings like from below, like it's as if someone just put the camera completely upside, like placed it with the view on on the on the ground. And it has a really strong effect. And creepy music playing over. Because, you know, Jordan Peele. Now, I, I thought the, the first scene with Troy, his boyfriend. Brianna and Anthony did a really good job setting up. Like, we get context for, you know, what's going on. What... And, and delivers exposition. Like, we got a lot of really important information, and they did a good job of making it feel fairly organic. And Troy tells the story of Helen Lyle. I, I quite like the, the... I... I guess I should have seen it coming. Honestly, I should have seen coming that when this, you know, when they decided this was going to be a sequel to a movie about urban legends and about how much they stray from the truth, how little truth there is in these urban legends, that the events of the first movie would become an urban legend. So you have these details about how when Anne-Marie found Helen, she was making snow angels in the blood, and they... they greatly increased the body count like apparently she killed a bunch of people when really you know other than that we the viewers of the original 1992 movie know that she didn't kill like I, I guess technically it's possible that she that Candyman possessed her body and made her kill those people while she was blacking out black yeah blacking out but certainly not very many people died in that movie where yeah and we see it with the paper cutouts. And the the retelling we get here, they save the baby from Helen, and she intentionally jumps into the fire to, to die. You know, so they really, they, they completely reversed the truth of it. And that is, like... 
the idea that Daniel Robitaille, who, you know, in, in real life he didn't exist, but this idea that, I mean, yeah, the, the, you know, the movie comments on police brutality, and it points out that if the, if the police, yeah, police brutality against a black person, then people start spinning stories, you know, media people start telling these ridiculous stories to defend the police, and, you know, the, the, yeah, if, if Candyman had happened in real life, if, if, if Daniel Robitaille in real life, you know, had gone through, I'm, I'm not talking about the supernatural stuff, but the stuff that happened in his life, you, you know, we know that they would be saying that he, you know, that he attacked Caroline, for example. And that's why they had to, to kill him. They wouldn't be talking about that, you know, oh, it was consensual, but of course, you know, her father didn't want his, he didn't want his daughter to have a black baby. So because of that, you know, and that's, yeah, you know, this movie takes the events of the first movie and run them through a filter saying this is a story being told by people who want to ruin the reputation of Helen Lyle. And ap after the conversation, Anthony does actually look up Helen. And, you know, the thing that, you know, he, he's immediately like, oh, wow, she did kill a Rottweiler. And it's such a clever... Because hypothetically it's possible that she did you know maybe she did it maybe Candyman did it but that's the like he immediately finds oh there at least some of it is true and and then we just kind of accept I guess you know maybe it's all true instead of yeah I thought that Anthony and Brianna were a really sweet couple and I was very glad to to see you know I figured if they're going to be such a sweet couple, then before the movie is over, they're going to be completely destroyed because of Candyman. And yeah, I, th I thought they did a really great job. Like early in the movie, you completely believe that Anthony, you know, what's, what's the word? She, she trusts Anthony, you know, and then, you know, later in the film, you know, when he starts smashing mirrors and such, she gets really scared, and so she doesn't want, and, and, yeah, so she, she gets away from him, and, yeah, it was really, like, you're, it, it's, we don't want to see them go, you know, split up, and we are told that Anthony actually has nothing to show at the, the, you know, there's this art gallery thing and he doesn't have anything to show and the guy's like, look, I don't want to take you out of the, but I need, I need to know you have something, you're not, you know, and they, they briefly talk about, well, maybe Cabrini Green, Cabrini Green can lead to some, yeah, and he gets a bee sting on his right hand while taking a picture of the church. I thought they did a really great job. I did not realize that the church was going to be so important in the in the third act, but yeah, you know, and it is like that. That they did a really good job. Like they don't introduce a sudden, you know, new setting from out of nowhere, because that's that's really frustrating. If you if you have if you get to the third act of the movie and then suddenly like oh now there's this place. It's just not going to... Sometimes it works. But it, it's really good if it can be a setting that was introduced sometime in the first two acts. Now, yeah, Anthony just heard that Helen didn't really understand or respect Cabrini. 
and now he is really doing it himself. He's he's just yeah. And I like the bit where like Anthony hears a cop car and he ducks. He didn't do like in, behind some some what's it called a, a brick wall. He didn't do anything wrong. He knows he didn't do anything wrong. Like he's not even like at most you could maybe say is he trespassing? No, I'm. I, I'm almost 100% certain he wasn't doing anything wrong there. And he knows, you know, like, if if the police spot him, they're not going to see his middle class status. They're going to see his black skin and assume that he's dangerous. I thought the uh, Burke was a really compelling character obviously by the end of the movie you're not exactly on his side anymore but you know he says you know oh yeah the police for there was a time where they barely showed up at all but now they show up over absolutely nothing and i forget exactly what he says but he says something like to protect maybe they're protecting us maybe they're keeping us trapped something like that and he explains who Candyman was to him, Sherman Fields, and we see that he was the kid at the start. You know, that's how time works. He was a kid in 1977, and and now we see what actually happened in 1977. And I gotta say, I really appreciate. Like, I've seen multiple movies. I guess. I suppose the yeah the last time I saw. Huh. Two movies that came out in 2013, I hadn't even realized, but yeah, Man of Steel and Thor The Dark World both have a major bit of exposition, both reveal very early on and then a little later, in the, like maybe towards the middle or later in the movie, and it's like we the audience don't need all that information twice, you could have just given us the information once, and in this movie they, yeah, you know, you, you don't, you do only get the information once. Now, yeah, Anthony paints Sherman and the cops swarm Sherman like bees, which was also a great, and, you know, this thing of, like, he, he was beaten, his face was beaten so badly what was it that they said that you could barely recognize him anymore? So, something like that, you know. And that is a thing, like, you know, some people are going to look at the 1992 movie and say, oh, lynching, you know, the relatives of slaves, that happened so long ago, that doesn't happen anymore at all. But the things that they say in this one, that, you know, the police brutality, that is stuff that happens, you know, the... So, so yeah, I, I thought they did a really great job with, with that. And we find out that, you know, Anthony's mother, who we later find out is Anne Marie, which I think would have been a good twist to just completely keep. But, you know, the, the, I, I didn't, I haven't read Wikipedia for this movie for the last for you know for for a number of days now i did read it i don't know a month ago maybe and there it had some stuff that i mean i guess i don't mind but i guess if hypothetically if i had a second if i could like time travel or something i would maybe have not have read that and that's just like most movies if the movie hasn't been hasn't come out yet it's not a problem for me to read the Wikipedia about characters and such, but I, th I think it would have been a good thing if I didn't know, you know, yeah. If, if someone is about to find out that information before watching the movie, try to prevent, you, you should not know going into this movie that Anthony is Anne-Marie's son and that he was the baby that Helen, yeah. You know, at first you think it's just oh, you know, it's a it's a running gag about mothers worrying too much. You know, she, apparently she told she told Bree that Bree was paying 
you know, Bri Brianna was paying Anthony money so that Anthony wouldn't talk to Anne Marie. But, you know, once he goes to visit her and you realize they're related, then, you know, you really realize it. And that's also, it. it's in the trailers, you know, her saying, I knew he had some terrible plan for you. And him saying, I guess he found me. That's a major twit. Like, you should not know that going into, I, again, it didn't ruin things for me. I, I kind of just shut that part off and only really notice afterwards. But, yeah. Anthony's painting of, you know, is, is really excellent of, of the, the, the police brutality. And we see that Anthony's really passionate about painting Sherman. And Anthony wants to summon Candyman, and Brianna says no. Which again, like I really appreciate how smart the, you know, how smart Brianna is in this for for so much. Yeah, she she doesn't go into the Burke's creepy dark basement. And the you know she realizes that summoning Candyman, you know, once she's in the cop car. She realizes the only way she gets out of this situation is to, to summon Candyman. And we see one of the teenage girls at the art exhibit I, there with her mother or something. Which is, that, that is legitimately, that is a good comment on like, again, I'm not saying all teenagers, hashtag not all teenagers, but... She goes to an art exhibit, and the one thing she takes away from it is, you know what? There's an urban legend that if you say a serial killer's name into a mirror five times, he's going to show up and he's going to kill you. Let's do that. You know, that like, she's, she's surrounded by all this incredible art. And the one thing that she... Apparently, the one thing she takes away from it is... Let's try to summon a serial killer. And and we find out that Anthony, you know, his the way he paints now is very different from before. And Tony talks to the the art critic and she completely tears him apart verbally and I, I'm not 100% certain if we're supposed to dislike her character. I think, you know, later in the movie, he does point out... I mean, she essentially blames him and other artists for depicting these things when he says, we didn't cause these things to happen. Uh, you know, and I, I don't know. I, I know basically nothing about criticism of painting. So I don't know if they, like, completely do, but I, th I think it might be that the movie is saying that, like, white people with, you know, with the power to put their words in front of countless eyeballs, they blame black people's problems on the black people suffering instead of acknowledging how things got this bad. But, let's see. Yeah, and I noted that some of the time, if someone tries to summon Candyman, it's to tease their partner more than, yeah. And Anthony is a mean drunk. Again, I don't know if I love the joke, but I do think they did a good joke. They, they delivered the joke well. That, you know, the um, Anthony says, you know, some, he's, he says something about this, the art gallery guy, how he has to pay for his interns, 
you know, chemical abortions and, you know, and, and like immediately the current intern whispers to him, don't worry, I, you know, I forget what it's called, but yeah, you know, she is using protection. I, you know, it, it was... It was, it was a good delivery of that joke that like you know it's it's immediately confirmed that yeah he does have sex with his interns and she's like don't worry you don't you won't have to pay for for my chemical abortion now, let's see the At first, it looks like there's going to be one of these sex scenes that a lot of horror movies have. And, you know, certainly sometimes it makes a lot of sense to have the, the sex scene. And, and sometimes it doesn't need to be there, but, you know, whatever, it's fine. But the, the, the fact that, like, it looks like it, there's about to be, and then instead they summon Candyman... And the yeah the the and and the bit with how like she like she like ties his her belt to him for the for the sex and then when she gets killed. He has trouble getting away from her because of the the belt. Yeah, I I don't think that's the right way to put it, but I hope you know what I mean. I, yeah. And it looks as though Anthony is channeling the Candyman at the exact same time that like he's he's sitting there painting, while Candyman is killing. And. Let's say, yeah, Anthony sees a bee in the mirror, but then when he tries to touch it, 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 you know, it is just reflection. Yeah, that's that's before he starts appearing as Candyman in mirror reflections. So that's basically like the first thing that, yeah. And we see that the. Yeah, you know, the art intern person got her throat slashed. And we don't actually see Candyman other than the reflection, which I thought was really, really excellent. Very nicely done. And, yeah, like, Candyman's first kills are maybe 30 minutes in or something in the, in the art gallery, and you only see his mirror reflection. You don't see... It's, yeah. And we see that Tony's right hand is really messed up by the bee sting, even not very long after. And when, you know, when Anthony hears the news of the, the killings and how his, you know, his name is mentioned and the, the painting he made is mentioned, you know, he like he smiles at the news and that like immediately we the audience are like, oh he, that's messed up. He should not be smiling. Like, we know that there's something wrong. But then it cuts and it reveals he's not alone. Like Troy and Brianna are sitting right there and they're like, What the fuck is wrong with you? How are you smiling at this? That was really, really fun. Like when it just happened, we think that ah, oh, he's He's sitting there completely by himself. He's not like if if you stay away from other people for a really long time, you start to forget what like is it okay, you know, what is it okay to smile at? What is it okay to be happy about? Like you know, cuz we're we're social animals. And you know, you maybe think that that's what's going on. He's been he's been so isolated because of the candy man, because of the beast thing and everything. But no, they're sitting right there, and they're like, "What the fuck is wrong with you?" That that was that was really funny. To I'm 
I'm glad that Jordan Peele didn't stop being funny when he started making horror movies, because he's really good at doing both. But yeah, you know, he was mentioned, and the painting, you know, by name, you know, they said Anthony, so Anthony McCoy, was that it, I think, and his controversial painting, Say My Name. And we find out that Brianna actually saw her dad suicide by jumping out of window as a kid. And I thought that was a really good, like, you, you understand why she's, you know, when, if, if someone starts behaving in a, in a dangerous or threatening manner, she's not going to just take it lying down. Like, with Anthony, you know, she immediately reacts and reacts the right way. I quite liked, you know, Brianna has a nightmare that Candyman is in the bedroom and then she wakes up and she looks and Anthony is standing where the Candyman was in the nightmare. So she's like, she is essentially perceiving it correctly, but and Anthony goes to the library to get stuff on Helen and the librarian is like really into him and she's like so disappointed when he walks off without having I think that might have been the best for everyone like if if she keeps hitting on him and he's like I I have a girlfriend like through several years like this is not you know and and I thought that was a fun like one of the one of the criticisms that the 1992 movie got was that it it plays into the stereotype that black men go after white women and you know it wasn't made by conservatives it was made by white liberals but there was still this idea you know like if you ask a a, cons a white conservative about, you know, black people and white women, they would say, oh, we gotta keep the black people away from our white women, that's the only way, you know, otherwise, you know, horrible things will happen, but if you ask a white liberal about, you know, keeping, sorry, a white liberal about black people and, and white women, they'd be like, oh, I mean, I get it, it's, I don't want to judge, but they probably should try to stay away from the white women, you know, not realizing there's plenty of, of, you know, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's an awful stereotype. And the, the idea does go back to, you know, what, what was it called again? The, not triumph of the will, but the other one, I forget what, but, but yeah, you know, the, the, that propaganda movie made by a white supremacist, you know, wherein black men go after white women and yeah so to in this movie there's a white woman who goes after a black man you know i, th I thought that was a, a fun little switch of the yeah and he you know anthony listens to an audio tape of helen's notes i, th I thought that worked well you know and i mean i guess did they record? I, f I forget if they recorded or just wrote down, but they, I think they, I'm not sure they changed any of the lines for when she, you know, when she talked to the, to the two black women cleaning the, the university. I'm, I'm not 100% certain. It, it's possible that they didn't have high quality audio of that. Like even if they got it off a DVD or something, it wouldn't be quite as high enough quality. And there is some where, like, I guess off screen, Helen got out like one of those little things, and like, you know, to yeah, noted things into, and it it works well, you know. And actually, now that I think about it, you know, Freddy Freddy's Revenge Nightmare on Elm Street Part Two was listed as a an inspiration for this. It did kind of have that vibe, like, 
you know, here's something that the protagonist of the last movie totally recorded their voiceover or wrote in a diary when you weren't looking. And they just never brought it up. Because, like, I feel like we would have, you know, it would have made sense for us to see. I'm almost certain we don't see her directly recording into. She records what other people say for when they talk, when they re retell urban legends. But anyway, I thought it worked well. And, you know, ultimately that is where, that's why they recast her. I don't think we even saw an image of her other than the, the I'm thinking publicity still from the first movie. We, we do see, like, in that article, news article, we see Virginia Madsen's face. And I like Anthony in the elevator stuck and, like, candy drops to the floor and and there's a razor blade in the candy and like blood drops and from the reflection above of Candyman. And the like the sound work is actually incredibly funny. <laughs> incredibly intense. And then incredibly funny. Like it it goes, you know, he's like he pressed the thing and like scary noises and he's on the floor, he's terrified, and then bing, doors open. And there's these teens, and they're just standing there staring at him. And he, like, collects himself and gets up and walks out of the elevator right past. That was really, really funny. Let's see. And it's, again, like, one of these things, you know, some movies would have it lead to, like, a really huge thing. And some movies would just have it end. But having it end in such a funny way is a good way of, yeah. And we, you know, we hear the Ruthie Jean story from the first movie. It's, it's that might have been part of the recording, I forget, the voice recording. And Anthony, you know, says he has to go out and Brianna's like, don't fuck it up. And he's like, eh, I'll be fine. Don't fit it, fuck it up for me, which recently he has not been great at. And she's she's been very understanding. Like, she didn't, as far as we saw, she didn't yell at him about the, like, she she wasn't exactly happy that he, like, freaked out at the, at the gallery and yelled at the, you know, you know, these these are people she she has to work with, and I like the the detail that you know now the art critic is very interested in in Tony now that there's a you know now now that there's real life violence. You know, I I feel like the movie is saying that the the you know too too many people are like real life violence appeals to them more than artistry and creativity and yaya does a really great acting job like he appeared he's he's suddenly really happy about the the you know he's he still doesn't seem like he's really upset that people died in this brutal yeah and he explains the gentrification to the critic and he tells her to summon Candyman he dares her and now we don't see I, I thought that was really great like I again it's like I didn't really think it for this movie but if it had been like a bad movie the moment that we see her standing in front of a mirror it's gonna be like okay now move you know let's let's please not just kill the momentum here we know she's gonna say it five times we don't see her say it even once if i recall but evidently she did because the candy man does show up and kill her come to think of it that was something i forget if i wrote it elsewhere does everyone in this movie who summons Candyman, 
Do they all die? Or, like, Brianna doesn't. Brianna summons him at the end and doesn't. The art person and his intern do. The critic does. The teen girls do. I guess that is it. But yeah, I, I really like, you know, Smash Cut away from the mirror. And we see that Tony, you know, Tony picks at the scab of the bee sting and it gets really nasty looking. And Tony's reflection is Sherman with the, you know, badly beaten face and the hook for a hand. And suddenly the critic opens the bathroom door. And Tony can't see... Like, his immediate reflection is now back to normal, but he does see, you know, Sherman in a reflection. And it's also like, we didn't think we were going to see her alive again. We thought that she had been killed out there. And the camera pulls away as the critic is murdered. And it, it reminded me of Frenzy when the camera also pulls away and we're basically... We're, powerless to do anything about it and Brianna you know I I put in quotes job interview at dinner and I thought it was a, a good scene and yeah we're told that the critic was found dead Anthony runs to Burke And Burke explains that there were multiple candy, candy men, candy mans, candy's man. You know, Daniel Robotal was the first, but there were others. And Burke has this really great quote to Anthony. They love our work but they don't love us, which so so just bitingly satiric. It's such an excellent, you know, and it, it is like, Jordan Peele also points this out in Get Out, like a number of white people actually are jealous of black people. Like they think that black people are incredible athletes, incredible musical artists and such. But they can't, you know, that doesn't then lead them to think, I don't think anybody who's that talented should have to suffer for their skin color. You know, me personally, I don't think you should have to suffer for your skin color. or You should have to answer for your actions, but not, not skin color. As any, anyway, and yeah, it's, it's such an excellent point and it's such it's so devastating it's such a such a powerful message and you know Burke adds that Daniel was burned to death which you know that was not in in any of the others so that that was a new you know the the both of the previous sequels adds something to the the retelling of the What's the word? Yeah, the the lynching of Daniel Robotot. Let's see. And Burke says pain like that lasts. Candyman is what happens. What does that say? What because of people hurting black people, so, something like that. And Anthony tells Brianna he brought back Candyman, and and he does like he he realizes how crazy it sounds. He starts out by saying, "I know this is gonna sound crazy," and she's gonna try summoning Candyman, and so he smashes mirrors and. Yeah, I already mentioned that, you know, she 
she gets she's scared of him so she runs to Troy and Troy's boyfriend and yeah I th I thought that was a a great yeah and Brianna smokes some weed and they talk about you know Troy and her talk about that I th I, f I think it's maybe him who says dad's work killed him and the and and you know yeah I think Troy is the one who says to Brianna you can stay here as long as you don't summon Candyman it's, yeah I feel like that's a that's reasonable and then we have the scene of Candyman being summoned by the teen girls I I'm afraid I did not write down the quote before I forgot but one of the girls tells you know one of the girls doesn't want to summon Candyman and actually, yeah, that character, you know, the character who does end up leaving before they say it all the times, does end up surviving. But yeah, I one of the one of the girls is like, I don't want to do it, and one of the other says, "Don't be a pussy." And she had such an excellent response. I, if I had to guess, I would. I think this might have been written by Nia Dacosta. It sounds like it was written by a woman. But she, you know, the teen girl responds with something like, why not? Pussies are warm and something. I, I didn't catch the whole thing, but that I've, I've for many years thought it's, it's so fucked up that the, that the word pussy is an insult. Like, it's, it's, I'm not going to make it weird, I swear, but it's just, it's, it's really fucked up, and I, I support any effort to re, you know, yeah, take, take the word back and make it a positive word again. I liked how Tr Trina, I think her name was, that she, you know, she's using her mirror to, like, like her makeup mirror, is that what it's called, to see Candyman you know, while she's still in, in the bathroom. And the teens were killed off screen with excellent audio. We we never do, like, get a good look at their bodies, if I recall. I thought that was really, like, there's this one who was apparently standing right in front of the I'm thinking facing the mirror. Yeah, the mirrors where they said it. And, like, we just see, like, a few drops. And then, like, a lot of blood comes down. And it's just, yeah. And we see that Anthony slept next to his artwork. And his hand is a lot worse. And now the, the art person, gallery person, finds Brianna more interesting once again, due to real life violence, and she also says, you know, oh, Anthony, very interesting with the, again, real life violence. And Anthony talks to a doctor, and the doctor says he has to be committed long term, so he rushes out of there. And Anthony goes to talk to Anne Marie, his mother. It's been a long time without them talking, and I, I thought that was a great, like, that's why she's always so concerned. Like, at, at the start of the movie, it's basically a joke. It's like, oh, come on, Mom, calm down. We talk all the time. I'll, you know, things will be fine. But she's not being this unreasonable, over-concerned person. No, she legit does have... Like, she's basically all the time thinking, any day now, Candyman's going to get him. Daniel Robitaille is going to try to use him towards his twisted evil ends as long as I keep, as you know, ever, like, every time that they talk, 
and that he doesn't say, Mom, there's something terrible, you know, something horrible has happened, have you ever heard of Candyman? As long as, then yeah, things will be okay. But she has to keep a close eye on him, which is also, like, I, I am not a parent, I will never in a million years be a parent. That's, that's a, that's a promise. So, you know, don't, don't worry. But I can imagine that as a parent, it's probably extremely difficult to let go of your child once they come of age. And Anthony talks about Helen and Candyman. And Emery told him that he wasn't born into where he needed to protect him. And part of it was this thing that she didn't want him looking into Candyman. And it's it's really, it's it's an excellent bit of, like, horror writing that she, she thought that if she didn't tell him that he had anything to do with Candyman, if he didn't know anything about Candyman at all, then he would be safe from Candyman, but at the end of the day, it still ended up going exactly how she feared. And Emery tells him about Helen taking him. Yeah, and she said, we, we thought Helen was crazy. Candyman wanted, what does that say, to burn you or something like that. And she thought once he, now that Candyman had burned, Candyman was over. And they all swore to never say Candyman again, but someone broke, you know, that promise. And Troy and Brianna go back to where Brianna used to live with Anthony to pick some stuff up. And I, I thought it was pretty funny. Like, Troy is like, Anthony, it's Troy and Brianna. We are here to pick up her things. And we are leaving with those things, okay? And, and Brianna's like, Troy, would you please give it a rest? Calm down, okay? Dial it, dial it down by like a good sixty percent, please. And it, they really feel like believable siblings. Like he, he does think that, like he his, he's probably thinking, I have to put on a brave front so that she, you know, to protect her. And she's like, would you give it a rest? And Brianna finds the, the pen, which, you know, that's what those kinds of pens are supposed to do. They're supposed to get you to go to the place where the, you know, the of the person working there, handing them out, you know. And she actually, she ends up stabbing him to death with his own pen. So, Yeah. And I, I, I really loved, you know, like, she's, you know, she, she enters the place where he's supposed to be. She can't quite find him. She opens the door, and the camera's down at the bottom of the stairs, and it's pitch black. And she's standing up there, and she's like, nope. And she shuts the door, and that's it. And, and I mean, we don't even see the basement, do we? Because the next scene isn't actually in the basement. It's in the church. Although, he would have had to get her out of there somehow. Anyway, I guess he maybe transports her through the basement, but she doesn't go in there willingly. And, you know, she tries to leave, but then the door is locked, and she, like, bangs on the door. But the person doing laundry, she's got, like, a, what are they called? Head, headphones? Wireless? Head, something. To listen to music, because she doesn't want to be bored while doing laundry, obviously. And she does eventually turn around, but by then Burke has grabbed Brianna. And we see a flashback where Burke's brother summons Candyman when they're both children. And the brother killed off screen by Sherman. And maybe a 
friend of, of theirs or something also. And Sherman, I'm sorry, Burke calls, let's see. Yeah, but, Yeah, Burke call, says that Brie is, Brianna is a witness, and he calls the cops and gives, like, completely false description. You know, it was very, very Karen of him. And, you know, basically, Burke is a cultist right out of, like, um, Rosemary's baby. And he points out about, you know, if something leaves a stain, then it's still there. You know, if you clean it off and eventually it rots, that's what happened to Cabrini. And we see that Anthony's skin, like his, like he looks completely different because of the, and we see Burke cut off Anthony's right hand. And it's so chilling that Anthony barely reacts. Like he's, he's not like, oh, it's so painful. He's just like, he's, he's, yeah, really, really scary. And also, like, I just rewatched the the movies. So I, you know, movies two and three, Candyman two and Candyman three, both show the sawing off of the hand, and it's nowhere near as scary in those movies as it is here. Like here, it was just really horrifying. And Burke says this Candyman will kill their fathers and sons, you know, m middle class and such. And Burke creates a new Candyman. Let's see. You know, by having Anthony killed by the cops. Let's see. And. You know, Brianna manages to get out of the restraints using the, the pen, which, you know, we've seen that a million times before. But I like that, you know, she does manage to overpower him. There's not, like, a really long, boring struggle or something. And Burke actually sings Candyman. And... The... Yeah, Brianna stamps Burke with his own pen. There was the thing she was going to hit him with, but she couldn't lift it. And again, for like for a fraction of a second, we're like, oh, it's going to take her a really long time. To kill. Nope, she's just going to use the pen. And she stabs him, I don't know, 20 times. And then Anthony walks up. I think he's dead now. <laughs> Like, you know, like, Anthony can barely walk, but he can, you know, make sarcastic quip, like, I have laryngitis, and it hurts to talk, so I'll just say this, you never do anything right. That's, that's where my mind went immediately. And, I mean, I'm guessing he, he you know... Yeah, Anthony walks up, he, um, he collapses, I'm guessing due to the pain, because we just saw the hook pushed in, that must hurt like crazy. And, let's see, the... Right, right. The yeah, the ending. You know, basically, Anthony. Like when when Candyman was, you know, he was the son of Daniel Robitaille was the son of a slave, so he was still close to being a slave. So when when the Candyman was someone who was close to being a slave, you know, poor people would die at the hand of Candyman. But now that a um, middle class black man, you know, like he owns, like he, he owns this apartment, if I recall, like the, the, not the entire build, not the complex, but the, you know, that, that wasn't cheap, even though it was, you know, yeah, it's, it's gentrified. So it's anyway, but yeah, now that, 
you know, middle class black person is Candyman, the the victims will also be middle class or rich. And that's like the way I see it, they can if they never make another Candyman movie, or if the next one is a a reboot, or so, which I guess technically this one is a reboot. Uh, this one is a sequel and a reboot. Or they can make one where the some of the victims are rich. You know, like, I mean, Jordan Peele has now written three horror movies, and each time he has something to say about... Like, I, I would say Us is more about class, but Get Out and Candyman 2021 are about racism, and he still has more to say. Like, I could imagine there might have been some people who watched Get Out and were like, well, you know, he has no, he probably has nothing more to say. But then, you know, Us comments more on, on class, you know, it's not... In, in Us, it's not about black or white, it's about class. And then with this one, you know, class and race, just... I could easily see them, th this same team, make another one and have more to say. I, I thought that it was... It was really devastating how the cops shot Tony on site like an off screen i don't i don't think we needed to see that and the the tragedy of like he was lying on the ground he was i mean he wasn't even moving and they just show up and immediately shoot him and then the cop pressures brianna into this supporting their story you know threatening her saying if you're you know Either you support our story, or you, or we treat you as an accomplice. And you know, it, it's, and she, and she gets an idea, and she says, "If can I see my own reflection? If I can see my own reflection, then I'll lie for you." And yeah, you know, she's allowed to see her own reflection. She summons Candyman, and and smiles, and there is this sense of. You know, ba like basically, the the um, yeah. At at this point, I noted the only way to fight police brutality is to say the name. I thought that was really compelling. Like uh, they could so easy like think of think about how easily it would have been to just have her manage to get a weapon and and shoot the cop or something, but no, she says the name. And it, it, yeah, you know, and, and obviously you, it's not a one-to-one. -one. They're not saying that in real life, you know, for, first of all, they're not calling for violence against cops, period. The movie is saying we cannot forget the black people who have been killed by hateful white people. You know, it is extremely important that we remember them. And, like, basically, the reason that Candyman... And, and, and actually, I, I wrote something about that. But, yeah, then we see Anthony as Candyman killing the cops. And we see he's completely bulletproof. And there's this bee swarm. I thought they did an incredible job. It looks so good. And... Let's see. Yeah, and, and he notes, you know, you're not innocent, but people will say you are. And that gives Candyman power. And we see the part of his body is bees. And Anthony as Candyman morphs into Daniel Robitaille as Candyman. And he says, tell everyone. And then the movie ends. And so, so yeah. Basically, the ending, my interpretation is, the this film's Candyman is not evil. White supremacy, including police brutality, is evil. Candyman wants to stop that. Saying Candyman into a mirror five times leads to your death and or the death of people you care about if you're ignorant. 
But if you know the true story about Candyman, it will not lead to your death. That's why Brianna doesn't die. She doesn't even get hurt. Like, Candyman doesn't even, like, threaten her or suggest or anything. He looks directly at her and says, tell the people the truth, basically. And, you know, the, you know, I, I don't think it's necessary for one of these movies to have, like, a token good guy white person but you know if that is something you want Troy's boyfriend survives and he's a, he's a good person he like Troy and he both say that if Anthony shows up and Troy's boyfriend has to get violent he will to, to, to protect Brianna from Anthony you know but the movie is saying if you're a white cop who deals with a black neighborhood then yeah you, you in in this movie those cops are evil it took black writers and a black director you know first to finally get an empathetic depiction of a candy man like there have been scenes where we where there was empathy for the candy man but this is essentially an origin story for anthony as the candy man I, th I thought they did a really great job with that as a like it legitimately is uh, what's the word y yeah you know one of the hmm. right right yeah um, I'm going to be talking about how this movie is in part tribute to um, yeah, among other movies, the second Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, Freddy's Revenge, in that movie, like, okay, the very, very ending says that Freddy is, at the very least, still alive, but the ending does seem to imply that, I'm blanking on his name, but the protagonist is not going to become... Fred, you know, Freddy is not going to take over his body, but in this movie, that actually, you know, Candyman does take over Anthony's body. And I, I really like, you know, Anthony could not have been more innocent when he was shot by the cops. He literally was not doing anything. He wasn't threatening anyone. You know, the movie really eviscerates this notion that, oh, well, they should have just complied there was no chance to comply. They shot him immediately. And this is something that has actually happened. I'm afraid I, I have a tendency to, to sometimes mix up the names. But a child, a black child, was shot within four seconds of the police showing up. He, he you know, he had a toy gun. And the, you know, the police didn't say, freeze, drop the gun. They just shot him immediately. If he were white, conservatives would lose their minds over it but because he's black it's perfectly okay to him and right i also know you know the white teen girls were appropriating black culture when they summoned Candyman. you know they they like the the you know that might be part of why it ended so badly for them and why, you know, Trina, the black girl, wasn't attacked at all. Because she wasn't taking part in appropriation. She wasn't taking part in the summoning. And it is this thing, like... Again, I don't want to... I'm not trying to rag on, like, teenagers. But white people appropriating black culture, that is a thing. You know, like, it's it's essentially, like how certain hairstyles, certain clothing, certain slang and, and such, yeah, will be appropriated. And yeah, I, th I thought it was a, a clever way to, to comment on that. Now, that brings us to the section 
entitled notes taken before watching. So I rewatched since you know these three movies are listed as inspirations in the movie by director Nita Costa. David Cronenberg's The Fly, Polanski's Rosemary's Baby, and Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2 Freddy's Revenge. And I am going to... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be spoiling these three movies in with without warning. The moment that I heard that, I was even more excited for watching the movie than I already was. From, from hearing the concept and from watching the trailer incredibly positive sign because these are three of the best horror movies ever made and there are three that make sense to take inspiration from for this specific movie like there are incredible horror movies out there that if I had heard that they were taking inspiration from those you know yeah from those movies for this I'd be like how does how does that like I I think the thing is the 1982 the thing is one of the best movies ever made one of the best you know, not even accounting for genre, but if I had heard that this, that that was an inspiration for this movie, I'd be like, how's, how's that gonna work? Because that movie's about, okay, so, you know, body horror, sure, but, like, paranoia and isolation, that doesn't completely work, but, you know, these three, yeah, so, here, yeah, the following is stuff that I wrote before watching the movie. All three of those make a lot of sense. I figure we'll get some body horror, a la David Cronenberg's The Fly, with the protagonist slowly turning into Candyman, his body changing in a terrifying way that he can't control. I thought they did a great job on that. You know, the the like him him removing one of the nails. You know, that's a very direct homage. And yeah, like the his body is turning into this horrible thing and you know, his his girlfriend can't help him. That's, yeah. From Roman, Polan Roman Polanski's Rosemary's Baby. See, the thing I thought was the eerie cult-like devotion to the evil supernatural. I guess, yeah, okay, we, we do get that with Burke, just not for very long. And from Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, Freddy's Revenge, the element of the protagonist losing control of their body to the supernatural, supernatural evil being that takes over their body and uses it to hurt others, physically even kill. And, yes, you know, I was a little bit surprised that that didn't happen earlier in the movie. It's only really at the very, very end that his body becomes this, you know, like, as far as we see, Anthony as Candyman only kills, you know, monsters, these, these horrible racist cops who murdered an innocent man but it's not something that Anthony would have done if he were still alive if not for the Candyman curse so you know he did he lost who he was that's, that's such a great like yeah he he was a good person he 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 wanted more people to care about the Candyman and he ends up becoming the Candyman, you know. That I also I very briefly want to say, like I, um, when I read on Wikipedia that Helen Lyle, you know, was listed as an evil spirit, I thought that she would actually be summoned. You know, not only heard the voice recording, but. Now, the first three movies have Innocence being blamed for his killings. First has Helen become a legend of her own. It seems like Candyman forced her to be killed, but we never see it. She blacks out, comes to covered in blood with a hook in her hand. Great choice for the movie, but I'm glad this is doing something different from that. This is the first of the films to show a character becoming Candyman, the way the protagonist of Freddy's Revenge gets taken over by Freddy. Yeah. You know, that, I, even, I, I, I suppose, 
technically both of them it's only when they become a legend that they but with Anthony we do see that his body is slowly being taken over. I'm I, th I think you you might say which is also that's also very Rosemary's baby you know the the protagonist's own body is gradually being used in a way that they wouldn't want because there's a supernatural entity in there and yeah like you know with Helen well, once again excellent movie I stand by that the first came 1992 came in excellent movie but that movie I, I, I think uh, it also it works well for the movie that there is this ambiguity that you're not 100% like you could theorize about what happened when we th this one isn't as much about theorizing but the you know with this one from very early in the movie Anthony is becoming Candyman and like even if like hypothetically even if nobody in the entire movie said the name of Candyman Anthony would still be turning into Candyman and Burke would still be trying to make sure that would happen and make sure there was a witness for it and all this. I'm afraid I forget exactly who said it, but I heard someone say that body horror is especially terrifying for black people because black people have historically not been allowed to be in full control of their body. During slavery, if you were black in America, your body, body basically belonged to your white owners. And according to the trailer, the urban legend for Candyman in this is that he was lynched by cops later found to be completely innocent of what they thought he did. So there you have the element of bodily autonomy taken from black people by white people for those specific white people's own ends. You know, they wanted to reassure, like, they, they were, like, you know, how could this possibly happen? So they, they go hurt someone so that they feel like they're in control again. I also was a little surprised, you know, on the cast list, it says that this is still Daniel Robitaille. Does this mean the new urban legend about him being launched by cops is simply not true? It was actually a different person and it didn't happen. And yeah, you know, the I, I do appreciate that they hid that in the trailers, that Sherman being a new Candyman wasn't really, you know, nobody directly said his name. And let's see. Yeah, I was wondering, is that part of the point of the movie that we ultimately don't know if he was lynched as a son of a slave or lynched as a guy going around giving candy? The fact that he's now giving away candy does help explain why he is named the candy man. It was always kind of forced the way that he got he got his name in the movies. In the second one, a kid tasted honey and said candy man. In the third, they chant candy man because the, the honey they rub on him. Honestly, I think Roman Polanski's Rosemary's Baby might be the scariest psychological horror movie that I've ever seen. I, I don't think I've seen another one that is as scary. And then, you know, I'm a cis man. It's definitely scarier to cis women. So, yeah. Like, I mean, I guess... Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm already spoiling Rosemary's baby. If you're a cis woman able to have children, the movie basically has all of the scariest scenarios that could happen to you. Rape, date rape, complete with a powerful sedative, losing your baby either during the pregnancy or after giving birth, there being something wrong with your baby, your partner and doctor taking advantage of your faith in them, gaslighting, isolation from friends, like it's it's like they sat down it's like it's like they said we are not leaving this room for the next 48 hours we are going to write every single cis woman's fear that relates to pregnancy in some way into this movie and they did an incredible job i've said it before and i'll say it again personally i don't find the satanist bit scary i never did but the gaslighting that we see in the movie terrifies me it always has and it always will now, so so yeah, I already mentioned, you know, I rewatched The Fly, and I appreciate that the cover for the movie shows the insect, just in case someone was worried that it was about the pants zipper. 
Now, let's see. So, what will the ending twist in this movie be? The first movie already did the thing with the protagonist taken over, taking over as the new Candyman. Let's see. And yeah, the you know the the thing is that he. Yeah, yeah, I've already talked about it. Anyway. You know, in the first movie, we find, out, we find out that Daniel Robitaille was an innocent man turned into a vengeful spirit as a direct result of the brutal murder of him. By the end of the movie, Helen has turned into a vengeful spirit as a direct result of her brutal death. Now, let's see. You know, Candyman tricked her to get into the fire because the, the, you know, the baby was in there and she chose to keep fighting to get the baby out. So there's this bittersweet quality where because she, Helen fought so hard for so long, she was able to stop the Candyman. That didn't mean that there was no longer a vengeful spirit, according to folklore, belonging to folklore of Cabrini Green. And I do like that. That does mean that this movie retcons, you know, th this movie. Like in the first movie, we don't know why Daniel wants the baby and baby anthony but this one says that baby anthony was useful to daniel candyman as you know and and i guess the idea come to think of it i mean So it can't be the gentrification thing, because that hadn't happened yet. I'm not 100% certain what Candyman Daniel wanted Anthony, baby Anthony for. I don't know, maybe maybe I'll think of it later, but let's see. The So, so if you know who Candyman is, then you won't die if you try to summon him. I mean, in the first, for the 1992 movie, it, it applies to this movie, but in the 1992 one, I mean, let's see, the, I suppose, essentially, they don't, let's see, Yeah, yeah, I think it... Anyway, in in the first three movies, Candyman talks a lot to, to the to his main victim, which in all three cases... And in the first three movies, it's always a white woman. He's always being very seductive, and like the... You know, in the third movie, we know that... This is like his his great 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 granddaughter, which makes it really creepy that he's still being seductive. Anyway, in this one, he's not really being seductive, and yeah, Candyman himself really doesn't say very much. Like, there's a little bit there at the end. He says a little bit, and he some of what he says he said in the first movie also. You know, the, I am the writing on the wall. What is innocent blood for, if not for shedding? And I, I think that it, it really worked. Like, that was also something that I thought, like, by the third movie, okay, we get it. He's seductive. He likes to talk. Like, and he, Tony Todd get, does a great job delivering the lines. You know, he, like, hypothetically... If he tried to hypnotize someone, I think he would be really good at it. But it really, like, they, they just, they didn't have any idea where else to, to go. And I thought this was much more interesting. You know, instead of him talking to them, it's that every so often his, you know, his mirror image, ah, his image will appear as the mirror image of Anthony. 
Now, let's see. Yeah, so in a YouTube behind the scenes, the director said, we realized it could be bad for the tension if it always plays out as expected. Someone says Candyman five times into a mirror, Candyman appears and kills them. So we came up with different ways for people to say Candyman five times, different deaths, previs, since figuring out how to film mirrors is tough. And new rocks, I also, right, the new Rockstar trailer breakdown you know, they point out that Candyman moves in a performative way, like Red in Us. And the Beast Sting may make Anthony's hand rot and rot until he has to cut it off. Candyman is still seductive. Now, let's see. the Yeah, so I also rewatched my own old videos. See, I would never ask you to watch one of my videos if I couldn't sit through it myself. And I say in my thoughts video on the first movie that the reason Candyman is defeated is because Helm proves to the people of Cabrini Green that he can be defied. It didn't work to make people not believe he existed, that makes him come back. But it does work to show people that he can be defied. Now, let's see, that... Does this movie back that up, or... Does it argue against it? Let's see. The um, I suppose hmm. I think an argument could be made that he yeah, he's had trouble coming back basically. In the first three movies, Candyman does kill some people who don't say his name five times in the mirror, like Bernadette, Helen's friend in the first movie. There are some that do that he doesn't, like Helen. She ends up dead, but not he's not intentionally killing her. And the the sequels, like all three, you know, the the old the first three Candyman movies, all three of them star a young white woman. And all three of them in their movie say says the says Candyman five times into a mirror, and all three of the these protagonists do. Well, Helen, Helen doesn't survive. The other two do, but Helen isn't killed by Candyman. Candyman wanted both of them to burn, but she manages to crawl out. Now, in this movie, does he only kill people who say his name five times into a mirror? I mean, now it seems like at least like when the 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 art gallery guy and his intern, like only one of them. I, yeah, she's the one who summons Candyman, but he also gets killed. So it's not only. And does he kill everyone who says his name five times into a mirror? I don't think we see anyone do it and not. Yeah. Now, let's see, the, yeah, so in the first Candyman movie, Candyman is seductive, he hypnotizes Helen to where she can barely move or speak, which works well, you know, it's, they didn't want to have a screaming woman in, in the movie, and in this one, there's also, like, some of the, the kills have no screaming or, or such, but yeah, in, in Candyman 1, like he does, in Hellraiser, Clive Barker mixes the sexual and the violent, Candyman doesn't just attack Helen, he kisses her while bees are pouring out of his mouth. And the movie isn't in a hurry. Candyman himself doesn't make an appearance until 40 minutes in, other than the opening voice over on the Urban Legend retelling about Billy. The sequels get to Candyman much quicker, however, do we get a good look at him in Candyman 21? I mean, Candyman, in, in this one, he doesn't even appear in the cursed form at all until like 30 minutes in, and there is only briefly reflection and such. And, yeah, like, we, we, I, I suppose I'd say that the ending, we get a good look at him, at, at, at Anthony as Candyman, but before that, not really. And I, I'm, I appreciate that they got rid of the, the sexual assault thing that, I, yeah, that really was in all of them, wasn't it? There, at least some sexual assault. In, in the first three, I, th I think there might be. 
but yeah and and maybe it it's in part because they're you know the protagonist is now male but still i i do really appreciate that and i think it was i i'm I didn't really miss we don't we don't see the bees that much in this we we see swarm a couple of times and they're at the end like part of his body I love seeing his exposed rib cage and all the flies in the first movie but then they just do that same thing in movies 2 and 3 and it's like I mean okay do you have any other ideas like I forget which one is it where he bleeds fly, bleeds bees. I think that might be the second one. Yeah, in the first one, they come out of his mouth and his torso. Then the second one, you know, she's trying to attack him. She rips down and his skin easily, you know, and a bunch of flies come out. That was a pretty decent idea. But then the third one, I mean, he commands a swarm and that swarm flies into windows with such force that they easily break them, which is just, that's not really scary. It's just kind of like, what? What? Did, how did that happen? Like, anyway. But the yeah, I th I think they did a really good job in this one with that. Now I guess that is right. I took some notes from reading the short story. I'm not sure I have very much to say. I th I think that they did a good job with the. 1992 movie of adapting the short story in a way that would work for the big screen if you took what was on the page and put it into a movie first of all it's definitely too short i think 30 maybe 40 minutes of movie and second of all they just all these things like almost everything that's in the short story makes an appearance in the movie but it's changed around you know the the angry dog that that suddenly jumps out of like a window and scare jump scares Helen is in both. Candyman preventing Helen from leaving is in both. And like Anne Marie like being terrified of Candyman. You know, there's like in the short story, Helen has a couple has numerous several run-ins with these like these these women like middle-aged or older women who tell her a little bit about Candyman, but then eventually they stop wanting any contact with her because she's telling other people and that's a problem. And they show up as the they're the cleaning ladies in the movie. You know, it wouldn't have worked in the movie to have them have Helen keep running into them, so they just they they meet the one time. But yeah, the the. Let's see. And the short story actually ends with Helen standing trapped in the bonfire. And the short story, Baby Anthony does actually die. If I recall, I'm not sure anything happens to the dog in the short story. So they, they swapped it around. In the movie, it's the dog that dies and the baby is saved at the very, very end. And that's also a thing where, like, Clive Barker likes to go into taboo. He likes to break boundaries. I think it works in the short story. I don't think... I think it would have been... Like, it's also... It's just... It's different. If you're reading a short story, you know, when... Like, it... I was shocked. And I actually... I watched Wee Lin's video before it, so I technically knew. But, like, it's... Like, I think I had kind of pushed it out of my mind because it's so uncomfortable. And then I read the short story. It's like, oh... The, kid is dead that's ah oh, that's so messed up but actually seeing a dead infant in a moot that ah oh, that's so gross like if you were ever going to show something like that in the movie there had better be an incredible reason for it i have seen movies that depict small children dying one of them was about the holocaust and there actually were very small children dying during the holocaust so that it makes sense to show it in that it's just it's reminding us how bad things were but don't show it just for like shock value and i don't think i wouldn't say that he wrote it into the short story for shock value there it works it it 
like the the whole thing is about how bad things are in these like kind of ghetto areas how how many people die in such brutal ways and how little people who live outside of it do to stop it and and these kinds of things and technically in the in the short story Candyman I'm also not sure if I recall we know nothing about Candyman other than that he exists and the people of Karini uh, is it even Green? it's not even Karini Green it's set the short story is set in England and I don't think any of the characters are black in it. It's it's all white people. But then they make the movie and they're like, let's give Candyman a backstory. Let's make him a, the son of a slave and, and set it in Cabrini. Like, I didn't know before I watched the movie that it was this thing, but it's a thing. You know, like, Cabrini Green was actually, you know, yeah, for a while it was this, like, ghetto, you know, this, yeah, this bad area, and the, the, ah, what's the word? The, the, um, but yeah, you know, the, the, the filmmakers behind the 1992 movie wanted to comment on that and let's see the and yeah the the you know the the boy who was castrated in, you know, that's in the short story, and I, I note it here. I'm not hugely surprised that was something that Clive Barker himself came up with. He's incredibly talented, and he absolutely terrifies me. Like, he, I've seen interviews, he seems like the nicest guy, you know, but just, it's a little scary that someone can write something that messed up. But yeah, he's he's incredibly good at coming up with these things, and, and writing them in a compelling way. Anyway, let's see. Right, in the, in the short story, she's documenting graffiti in poor areas. She's not looking into urban legends. She, you know, she doesn't, when she goes in there, into, into the neighborhood, she's not looking for urban legends at all. She just wants to document all this graffiti. And, you know, at one point in the, in the short story, she's like, okay, I gotta go to the neighborhood. I gotta take these important pictures and like and that's like the 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 movie essentially opens after she's already made some of the decisions that she makes like around the midpoint of the short story again it, it works really well for the short story anyway let's see the Right, and the, yeah, in the short story, Purcell, who's also in the movie, in the second movie, briefly, he brings up the story of the lovers and the lunatic, you know, the the urban legend that is told at the start of I Know What You Did Last Summer. So, so yeah, the short story is now where the movie basically opens. And, let's see. Trevor is way more obnoxious in the short story, way more, like, easily hated. Like, they, they really toned that down in the movie. But he's also a real asshole in the movie. Now, let's see. The... Yeah, and in the short story, she barely cares that he's cheating on her. Where in the movie it's a big deal and it works really well for the movie. Let's see. And the. Uh, let's see. 
the Yeah, the short story makes it clear that a lot of people have died, but the, you know, it, I'm almost certain the short story is saying that in reality, in, in the reality of the story, the Candyman has killed people over dozens of years, over a really long time, but every time that he kills someone, someone else takes the blame, and they basically, like, they kind of willingly do that because they're worried that otherwise he's going to kill even more people. The, the short story actually ends with the, let's see, yeah, the, the, uh, Yeah, and the thing with him kissing her, you know, some of the bees, yeah, some of the bees crawl on her lips, in her ears. Yeah, again, not really surprised that Clive Barker is an incredible writer. He's he's written some of the most terrifying, but, but yeah, this, the mix of the sexual and the violent, he does a really great job of that in the first Hellraiser movie as well, which he also actually wrote and directed. He didn't only write the short story. Now, let's see. The... Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the story ends with her burning and Candyman is there. And he's clearly not worried since he's been dead for a long time. The flames can't do anything to him. She realizes that Trevor is standing there, but he doesn't appear to spot her, even though she hopes that he will. And, you know, it's, it's something like, you know, she hopes that uh, maybe he'll finally... It, you know, in, in the movie, it became her saying, what's the matter, Trevor? Scared of something. Which, which works really well. Both, you know, she says it to him after coming out of the after escaping from the, the mental hospital, and she says it when she comes back to life, or when, yeah, when she comes to, to kill him at the very, very end. It works well for both, and yeah, I would say they, they kind of, they rewrote some of what she thinks to herself when she's seeing him as she burns to death. So yeah, basically the first movie greatly expanded upon the short story, it changes the ending, and it really, like, I think they did an incredible job adapting it. I, I think all of the changes were necessary, and I was surprised by how much in the movie is from the short story. Let's see. And yeah, Summoning Candyman, by saying his name into a mirror, doesn't appear in the short story at all. Like, Candyman kills people, but there is no mention of saying his name into a mirror. So... You know, that's that's one of the most iconic aspects of it. So I'm really glad they, you know, technically in the movie, they didn't come up with it out of nothing. They, they you know, it's it's based on the, what, what are those called again? What's, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Bloody Mary. You know, you say Bloody Mary five times into a mirror. That that was a, an urban legend for a while before the 1992 movie. But then, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that they, did the yeah but it does have the razor blade candy the the short story now and 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 the candy man does identify himself as the candy man i don't think anyone else does in the text and and his name is only mentioned very close to the end he appears uh, yeah i think i would like the short story a lot more if i had read it before watching the original 1992 movie where the movie was made to comment on race and America, in the original short story, no, almost no one is described by their skin color. Candyman is one of the only, and he's white. His skin is basically pale. 
If I had to guess, I would say that everyone in the short story is white. The short story does comment on how some people live in horrible neighborhoods, but in the short story, the story, the people who live there are not black, but white, like the rich ones. The short story has the element where Kenyon wants Helen to live on his legend, the way he does himself, but does not have the element the 1992 movie does, where he takes over her body to kill someone, so she's blamed for killings. And in the short story, Candyman lures Helen into the bonfire movie. Let's see. Yeah, he, he lures her in there, but she does manage to get part of the way out against his will. Let's see. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to talk more about baby Anthony. Let's see. And the... Yeah, you know, in the short story, Candyman blocks Helen's path when he first reveals himself to her. Where in the movie, they're both in a parking garage. They're very far apart, showing that he doesn't need to be close by. Go, be close to you. You don't need to be trapped in a small area for him to be able to get to you. In the short story, we're never sure what created Candyman. Helen's trying to figure out where these terrible stories start, and the answer appears to be Candyman, but we don't know where he came from. I don't know if maybe it's supposed to be like the, an eternal evil being and we just don't get more details. Where in the movie we're told exactly what happens to Daniel Robitaille, who isn't even given a human name in the short story. And in the short story, uh, there's no indication that he wasn't always this evil being. There's no... Again, I'm not criticizing the short story. I, I, think, I, I think I might be sounding like I am. I'm not. I don't mean to be. It didn't hit me as hard, other than, once again, dead baby Anthony, but, or Carrie in the short story, but the, it didn't hit me as hard as, you know, yeah, some, some other writings, but anyway, the, what's the word? I'm just saying, I'm glad that they changed it for the movie. In the short story, you don't know anything about Candyman. He just, he's there, he kill, or you don't know anything about his background. You don't know if he's human, you don't know if he's a ghost, or if he's been around forever. You know, he has the, the B, if I recall, the, the torso, you know, the exposed torso of bees and such is in the short story as well. But there's no indication where that came from, and there's no indication what started what what originally led to the 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 candy man now and in the short story there's no such thing as defeating the candy man he will always win if not right away then eventually the movie appears to say that it is possible to create a new legend if you defeat candy man that's what happens to helen let's see And, yeah, you know, basically in the short story, Candyman reveals himself to Helen because she thinks that there's no one out there who's that monstrous. Where in the movie, the only reason that Candyman reveals himself to Helen and starts forcing her to attack people or attacking people, making it seem like she was alone doing it, is because a lot of people stop believing in Candyman. The people in Cabrini Green, the neighborhood, stop believing because the criminal who attacked her was arrested. People thought he was the Candyman. No one stops believing in the in the short story. People start knowing about these killings. People outside of the neighborhood start hearing. Of, actually, yeah, now that I think about it, I think in the short story, they a lot of people die, but only people who live in the neighborhood know about it. They don't call the cops, and they, in fact, they burn the... the corpses so there's no evidence left there's no physical evidence left where you know in the in the movie it's saying like every so often someone dies in cabrini green and some of them are killed by Candyman. some of them are killed by that that criminal who just goes by Candyman. now right i took some notes for the trailer wow way way back on the the 28th of February last year, when Jordan Peele made Get Out, I made a note 
uh, to watch it down the line when he made us. I did the same thing. Now he's putting out Candyman, and I am definitely going to watch it in theaters. And yes, I realize he produced and wrote this one. He didn't direct it. I'm still really hyped about his influence on it. And since taking these notes, I have watched Get Out and Us. They're incredible. It is pretty wild that this is the first of the four movies to be directed by a black person. The first three were directed by white men. Like, it's it's such a fundamentally... It, the, the story is so centered on black people, and yet, yeah. Holy crap, the eyes on the guy who explains the legend are terrifying. I guess, yeah, Burke, yeah. Of course, a scene of a group of young people talking about the legend. I'm going to test it out. Holy crap, like half a dozen white teenager girls are going Candyman in front of a mirror in what looks like a high school bathroom. Finish it, but it's still alive. Black girl walks into the bathroom, and they try to leave, but the door won't open. It's not quite the same as anything we saw in the three old movies. I appreciate that. It's a variation on it. One of the girls notices a, fly, a bee flying by her hair. We don't see the actual attack. We only see the black girl terrified in a stall. The photographer character is now a young black man who's an artist instead of a young white woman who's a university student. Cabrini Green, the neighbor, is still part of the mythology. Candyman came around a candy factory in the neighborhood of the house. Just a joke. He's putting up paintings based on graffiti. Paintings from the neighborhood. He wants to spread the story about Candyman. She's a fan of the in the mirror and say Candyman, the young black woman shushes. I I hadn't realized at the time that that was Anne Marie. I just wrote because she's seen a horror movie. And yeah, a man is grabbed as he tries to leave the house and dragged across the floor backwards. We only see the shadow of Candyman on the wall. He appears to be dragged by nothing visible. Jacques realizes he's made a mistake. When he looks in a mirror, the reflection is that of Candyman. And he moves exactly to his movement so it's not just that he's seeing some someone else it is now his mirror image is now Candyman which I really I don't think you should know that before going into the movie that that's going to happen I brought him back he has a purpose for you to be a herald of his stories I guess he found me we see a lot of individuals attacked and killed this thing's gonna have at least a dozen people for a body count the last thing we see is a young woman looking through a partially open door, seeing the leg of a black victim with bees growing around open wounds. Then he opens the door and sees the blood soaked screen door for a shower. And the hook thing pushes against the trap ends. I greatly appreciate the focus on black people. I would say there's at least two thirds black people in the last third white people in this trailer. The fact that the Candyman is black and his birthplace is green, green, a black neighborhood is central to the character. The character was created by a white man, Clive Barker, but he... Yeah, and... Yeah, I wrote that when I thought that Clive Barker made the decision for Candyman to be black, but... Yeah, the the, the people who decided for to make him black for the first movie clearly intended for it to explore the way black people have been treated in America. I would say the first movie does a great job of exploring the character. Meanwhile, there are almost no black characters in it. Let's see. I appreciate we won't get a good look at Candyman, only glimpses. They're not giving that away, which will lessen the impact. I hope we don't get many good looks in the film itself. And that's, yeah, we didn't. In the trailer, he's seen in shadow reflection at a distance. And I noted, yeah, the, the first of the, let's see, March, the first of March, I love the poster with the readied hook covered in honey with a bee on it. And Yeah, and two and a half months later, I know the original movie, and possibly the short story. That Yeah, that was before I read the short story. is about how black people are abused by white people, even when they've done nothing other than try to coexist peacefully. It's done to the man who becomes Candyman. It's done to the people who live in the bad neighborhood of Green and Green. The only way this black man can have any power is based on how he is treated by the white people, and his death remaining a cautionary tale. The only way this black 
Okay. Uh, yeah, can have powers through his death, through the example and the injustice of it. The black people of Tabrina Green have no power. Now, the way they had no power when he was alive, except for the criminal posing as Candyman. In other words, yet again, the only way for a black man to have power is through his death. White people saw a black man and a white woman. With a white woman, they immediately jumped to the assumption that he was raping her, that to kill him to preserve their white women. Now, let's see. Yeah, and I noted the exquisite sort of paper cut out silhouettes thing, telling the background story of the Candyman. I thought that was really clever because the person telling the Candyman story is Burke. And when Burke was a child, he did these paper cutouts. I think this might have been the director saying this. The Candyman is how we deal with the fact that these things happened, that they still happen. I know that I love that they're facing this thing head on. Tell everyone. And okay, I think I'm just, I'm just gonna rush through the yeah. So this is from the second trailer. The yeah, I told the backstory. It's still vigilante justice. They're yes, they're cops, but he doesn't get his day in court. They kill him on the spot and claim he was resisting with the cutting off the hand. It's essentially still a lynching. By white men over a perceived slight by a black man. But they updated it and now it's done by uniformed police officers. It's still in public, he's still innocent. And the razor blade thing that wasn't him, he was a good man doing good, and the white patriarchy destroyed him. So this divorces it from the original where he was firmly rooted in slavery. I figured the idea is to say we don't have to look that far back. You don't have to think about slavery to find examples of innocent black men being broken by white men of power. The movie looks absolutely terrifying. Can't wait to watch it. I continue to love that you barely see Candyman himself. Only a few brief bits before he's attacked by the cops. In these trailers, I'll grant that it does still show too many of the kills. Too much of the gore. I'm not saying the movie has too much gore. I'm saying the trailers give away too much of the gore. But considering how overexposure completely ruins some horror movie monsters, I really appreciate that we don't see much at all in these trailers. And the idea of the protagonist being possessed by a Candyman is great, something that was also happening in the first movie. I've long said that far scarier than the idea of being killed is the idea of losing control of myself, hurting people I care about. I love the way the backstory is told, these cut out shadow puppet figure things intercut with live action. Yeah. Okay, so I copied in. I I didn't get to reading them before, but I copied in the the reviews currently up. So I'm just I'm really quickly gonna skim and see if there's something I want to comment on. Now let's see. Yeah, a lot of positive reviews. And let's see. The um... The opening scene where a hook-handed man comes out of a hole in a wall to offer candy to a child is pure nightmare fodder. Most other horror movies wish they had an opening that strong. Seriously. Yeah, some of the some reviewers saying that it's not that scary. I don't really understand.
Let's see. Um, some people calling it bland. I don't really follow. Now. Yeah, some people saying it spells things out too much. I agree it spells things out, but I don't think it's too much. I think it's the, the right of... I, I feel like we've kind of... There have been subtle movies about... Subtle movies and TV shows and such about racism. And way too many people didn't get it. So yeah, now they've gotten explicit. I don't... Like if you're if you're upset that it's now explicit, your issue is with all the stupid people who didn't get it before they got explicit. And now the those same stupid people are they understand it and now they're saying, Well, I don't like you preaching to me. Well if you didn't do such destructive things, you wouldn't there wouldn't be people preaching. Now, let's see the Candyman doesn't merely note the connection between fear and remembrance, it also interrogates it from every possible angle. Yeah, I don't really have much to say about. Now, I... Candyman has an unmistakable anger embedded within its scares, persuasively depicting how black Americans feel traumatized by a country that treats them like monsters. Together, Peel and DaCosta have made a definitive Black Lives Matter horror. Deeply harrowing and sorrowful performance from Abdul Mateen. Now. Yeah, so far I'm not really. You know, I'm I'm reading the the quote from the negative reviews, none of them really making a lot of sense to me. I don't mind reading negative reviews of something I like, but like one of them said that it doesn't really explore the issues particularly deeply. I mean I I don't I don't see how that could I, I feel like that's the movie spends the movie does a really great job of exploring the now a jolt of macabre adrenaline Now. 
Okay, yeah, one one reviewer says it's it's better than us, but it's not quite as good as Get Out. I think an argument could be made that Get Out is overall better. Yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, so the... Hmm. Who can take a reboot? Sprinkle it with something new, cover it with blood and bumblebees, and a pointed social commentary or two. Candyman can. No. Heh. <laughs> One critic says the movie never entirely hooks you. I don't, I'm not sure if movie critics are paid extra four puns. I think an argument could be made that they should be. It's some of the most fun and memorable parts of, you know, I, I read a lot of reviews and it really, it's, it's, I always like perk right up when I read like a pun or, or the like. Now... Yeah, several critics say that there are problems with the ending. I don't know. I, I don't... I can't currently think of a single problem with the ending. Now, let's see. Almost done. There's a fantastical dreamlike quality to Anthony's arc over the course of the movie that ends up making this feel somewhat like a Pan's Labyrinth-esque fairy tale rather than a straight blood-soaked thriller. Hide your mirrors and look out for bees. Candyman is returned, more relevant and terrifying than ever. I figure this will probably, like the movie was, the, the original movie, like a ton of people had watched it, and yeah, like, uh, you know, apparently for a number of black people, Candyman was their boogeyman, you know, because there really aren't that many black, like, slasher villains. And I can imagine this movie will spread it even further and increase people's passion for it. One reason this Candyman never feels like a formula slasher film, even during the murders, is that DaCosta stages them with a spurting operatic dread that evokes the grandil grand grandiloquent sadism of mid-period De Palma. Nah. This film is a tasty confection of satire and scorn. Now. Uh, 
Okay, almost done. Lego sequel. Yeah, I guess it is, isn't it? Yeah, at least one critic didn't think that this movie is better than the 1992 one. 100% disagree. That the original one is still great. I watched it yesterday and I still love it I could watch it again tomorrow but this one is a better movie oh, now I did see oh okay yeah almost 100% done Okay, those were the Rotten Tomatoes. Now we're going with the Metacritic one. Yeah, so on Metacritic, it has a 72 score based on 34 reviews, 27 positive, 6 mixed, 6 mixed, and only 1 negative. So I'm just really quickly... Ah, my back. Holy crap. Okay. Let's see the... While the kills perpetrated by mo being mostly st just seen in mirrors are sometimes a bit too obfuscated by their gimmick to be viscerally satisfying, they slot in perfectly with the film's themes and aesthetic even when they're not dumping cascades of blood. Yeah, I think... I can, I can see what the, they mean by that. Yeah, the, for sure. If, if, you're, if you go into this movie hoping for like a Jason movie with a ton of really like brutal killings on camera. Okay, it is getting very dark out. I am gonna I'm gonna finish the review really quickly. But yeah, it's not gonna deliver that. Then you'll be frustrated. Now let's see the Almost. The new Candyman references the plot of the original as a, sin as a sinister fanfare of shadow puppets, as if to say, that was mythology, this is reality. 
It's less a slasher film than a drama with a slasher in the middle of it. Yeah, so here there's a this person yeah, 63 out of 100. Candyman can't seem to decide whether it wants to scare you or make you think. I think it does an incredible job of both. Let's see. Okay, so Okay. That is everything. Let's see. So, here we go. If you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two, one, yeah, one, two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and or sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show, which is currently What If. And currently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog, as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.